Hey, Susan, and hey, everybody. Thanks for being here for the Saturday, May 20th, Illinois Homeopathic Medical Association and Academy of Veterinary Homeopathy Clinical Study Group. And we have two really, really good speakers today. So we'll just get right to it. We have Dr. Susan Beal, uh, DVM, and uh, she's so knowledgeable on so many things. But one thing we really wanted to tap her excellent mind power with today was glyphosate toxicity because she knows more about it than anybody else I know. So without further ado, here's Dr. Beal. Thank you so much. Thanks guys and thanks for your patience as we're doing tech stuff all over the continent. Um, so as, as Bob said, I want to talk a little bit about glyphosate and glyphosate toxicity today and and um, in, in full transparency, uh, we're going to talk about some stuff that different organizations and entities do. And I do do, do some um, consulting work on non-compensated consulting work for the, the guys at uh, Health Research Institute uh, labs. So the HRI labs, just to be clear on that. Um, so let's just let's just go. The reason I use this slide for the intro slide is, A, it's a really pretty slide of a friend of mine's late dog. but it's a picture of a dog jumping into a field of soybeans. And, and my friend's husband took the picture because he thought it was beautiful. But what he didn't know is when he took that picture, um, the, that, that sort of stuff that you might think is like sunshine on the soybeans, that dark and light and dark and light that, that you see is actually a soybean field that has just recently been sprayed with glyphosate. And, and you see that, um, they call it flashing and it's because of the way that the nutrients get bound um, from the glyphosate application. So I think it's a really beautiful slide to show that. And, and if you guys, I mean, a lot of you guys live where there's lots of big bean fields and stuff. And, and if you've never seen that before, as, as soon as you start looking for it, you won't be able to miss it. We can't talk about glyphosate without talking about the whole genetically engineered stuff. So I want to just put some context in that. Um, we know that we have field crops and row crops that are genetically engineered for pesticide resistant. Um, all of them re reduce, um, uh, resist uh, herbicide Roundup, which in which uh, glyphosate is the active ingredient. Some of them are insect tolerant and they have stacked different kinds of genetic engineering and resistance onto these plants. So you might hear somebody talk about triple stack corn or, and that sort of stuff. We, we talk about genetic engineering too. Uh, we need to realize that it's being used commonly for making drugs and vaccines and, and other things. And, and that, in my opinion, is also hugely significant, but we're not going to go there. So we need to think about how do we create these plants and other things that they're, that they're genetically engineering. And, and they can do basically one of two ways. And now we're doing the, the CRISPR sort of sloppy cut and paste technology. So sometimes they'll do plasmid replacement technology. So they, they put a desired gene into the bacteria and then they force by use of, of uh, inputs similar to adjuvants, they force the, the genetic material to insert into the plant. And that insertion into the plant gets really random and it actually it can just go anywhere in that sequence of information that's coding for protein information. So if it inserts in a um, vulnerable or significant place, we can really see other changes happening in, in that plant. The other thing that they do is kind of like a shotgun. They shoot millions and millions of micro little pellets coated with the desired gene plus a gene for antibiotic resistance into the plant. And then by chance, a few of those pellets might hit a cell nucleus and get integrated into the chromosome of the cell. But it's not very efficient, so you need to see which of those cells got, got engineered, got the little pellets stuck in the nucleus. And so they do that by, by growing these up with antibiotics because the resistant gene won't die when it's planted with antibiotics because we have that little antibiotic resistance thing that's also in with the gene we want to we wanna, um, insert. And so then they, then they re-regenerate and, and, and that plant cell to create a whole plant. Now we have CRISPR and this whole new wave of gene editing that's happening now. And the gene edited materials, um, it's problematic. They, they think they're cutting and pasting, but they drag a lot of extra stuff along and they're not always very accurate where they land things. And the other, so, so there's 
inaccuracies and collateral damage to that. And also, there's a really different regulatory thing happening with them because folks are saying, oh no, we can't tell whether this is done, which is not accurate. Um, and, and we're gonna just let industry regulate and let us know whether we have these, these CRISPR gene edited things. And they're putting gene editing in a different category than genetic modification, and, and therefore they're missing some of the regulatory stuff. So, so getting back to, to our thought about um, uh, gene edited plants and, and Roundup ready plants, we're seeing resistance to these genetically modified plants. And we see it for, for the insect resistance and we also see it for the glyphosate resistance. And that means that we're increasing the concentration of the substances we're spraying, we're spraying more and more and more, and we're piggybacking other pesticides like 2,4-D and dicamba and paraquat on top of the glyphosate that's already been being exposed. This is uh, this is uh, only goes to the uh, about 10 years ago, but we can see the percentage of planted acres in in uh, this is North America data, USDA data, uh, looking at corn and uh, cotton and um, and beans planted. So when we look at that whole environment that you know what's happening here we're seeing an increased use of agrochemicals not just glyphosate and glyphosate based herbicides but other agrochemicals we're getting lots of drift and cross pollination from these genetically modified uh, plants and we also have this thing that they call gene flow so the bacteria pick up the genes from decomposing plants and then that transfers them through the environment and up into the human and animal bodies, and that can influence microbiomes of of the of the plants and the animals and the humans. Um, and and that influence is broad-reaching, and it includes the antibiotic resistance because we remember we had to label those desire, desired genes with the antibiotics, so we know if the plant was there. There's also a great lot of stuff talking about substantial equivalence with respect to nutrition you know oh these are essentially the same which we're finding out they're not uh, there's questions about food safety and food safety testing and then there's a huge question about these whole business of rogue proteins that happen when we get gene insertion and disruption of the normal genome and and there's really lots of fun and interesting and frightening in a way papers now being published talking about the collateral damage that we see from that. So this isn't a situation in isolation. We can't talk about glyphosate and glyphosate-based herbicides without looking at the whole larger um, agro-pharmaceutical system. And, and we need to remember that this is a systemic system and it's supported by policy and legislation and regulations. And a lot of the regulations have been captured by the corporations that are building this technology and, and selling these products. We only need about 40% influence in any industry by a sing, sing, single corporation or, or consortium of corporations to, to actually uh, find out that we have regulatory change. So the same relatively small group of companies owns the seeds, they charge a tech fee to the farmers for using their seeds, they have kill genes in the seeds so that you can't save the seeds and besides the tech seeds say you can't save them, you can only use them from one season. So, so the whole business of seed sovereignty is, is a, a tremendous issue, we could talk for a day on that. But the same relatively small group of companies that own the seeds also make the agrochemicals, the fertilizers and the pesticides, and they also make the drugs that we're buying, or some of us are buying, you know, as clinicians, both on the human and, and animal side. So it's a big mess, you know, what comes first, the chicken or the egg? So we're going to focus on glyphosate today, A, to make the day manageable, and B, because it's actually the most widely used herbicide on the planet. And I wouldn't be sticking my neck out too far to say that it's also the most widely used antibiotic in the planet, because it does have a patent as an antibiotic. So all of this concern about antibiotics in foods, glyphosate is not in the conversation except about, you know, I I think there's feels some days like there's about six of us in the whole world that talk about it. But but there's a very small faction of people who are who are talking about the influence of glyphosate as an antibiotic, not just as an herbicide. Globally, there's 
300 and, or 736 million pounds used globally. I can't even imagine how big a train load of glyphosate that would be. The thing that you need to recognize too is 114 plus million pounds of this is used for non-agricultural purposes. So they're spraying trees and forestry plantations and soccer fields and hydro right of ways and gas pipeline right of ways and golf courses and hiking trails and um, parks and, and those sorts of things. And that's a huge, huge, huge exposure. Um, that was, you know, that was Dwayne Lee Johnson's exposure. He was working for a, a, a town that was spraying glyphosate uh, and parks and trails. And we know without, you know, without belaboring the point, but we're gonna a little, that we have all sorts of increasing health effects and widespread problems with chronic exposures. This is again, a little bit dated, but just looking at, <clears throat> at all of these graphs that you're gonna see by the USGS, they don't really talk very much about the other than row crop type of use of glyphosate. So I think that our overall use in the community is really hidden. If we go back historically, it, it's patented as a boiler descaler and an antibiotic. It's got a huge, strong chemical action. And, and unlike some other herbicides um, and pesticides, it's actually systemic. It's incorporated into the plant. It, it incorporates particularly in the rapidly growing areas. So we see it in the grain and the, and the seeds of the plant, and we see it in the roots and the root nodules of the plant. And the other thing that this means is it's not like, you know, organophosphates are not my favorite pesticide in the world either for a lot of reasons, um, but you can wash those things off. Glyphosate, you can't scrub it off your, your plant. It acts in really low doses. It's classified as a, a probable carcinogen, and it's, it, it, um, it's a known carcinogen for animals. And one of the things that it does is it really strongly binds and chelates cation minerals. So all our positively charged minerals are grabbed by glyphosate, and they grab them in a way that the mineral cannot be biologically available for function. So even if we do a, a mineral analysis in the plant or in the feed, the minerals may seem there in the analysis, but functionally they're not there in the physiology. The other thing that we find that glyphosate does is it alters the bacterial populations and, and it intensifies pathogens. So we see uh, salmonellas and, and um, some of the uh, Enterobacteriaceae and some of the some but not all of the Clostridium. Those those things uh, it 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 really uh, intensifies their growth and it is toxic and reduces the growth of a lot of the beneficial organisms. And right there, you can see that that's a recipe for microbiome imbalance. We know that it's an endocrine disruptor. I'll show you some really new evidence more new evidence about that. We know that it's cytotoxic to all sorts of cell lines um, and, and concentrates in the growing parts of plants. We also know that the reason that it works is because it causes malnutrition and immune function changes and microbiome shifts. This happens in the plant, it happens in the soil, and it happens in animals and man. And, and so those uh, immune functional changes and microbiome shifts are part of the things that we have to deal with and talk about and think about when we're thinking about the toxicity. This is just a real quick slide to remind everybody that, you know, these minerals don't act in isolation. They're all interrelated and one influences the other and, and interrelates to the other. We know that glyphosate doesn't work in sterile soil. This is some early work that Don Huber did to, to show that. And so the plant on the far right is a soybean that's grown in, yeah, that's their control plant on the far right. The plant on the far left labeled A is a plant that's grown in sterile soil. And the plant in the middle labeled B is a plant that's grown in regular soil, you know, soil that's got biological populations and, and activities in it. So you can see that the A plant it looks a little bit droopy. It was it was sprayed with glyphosate, and it's going to take a lag of oh three to five to seven to ten or fourteen days, based on the fact that the nutrients are chelated, so the plant can't get any nutritional mineral energy. But after that passes, that plant it'll be stunted, but it it goes along and is a plant. That plant in the middle is a plant that that was um, 
sprayed with glyphosate, the bacteria in the soil um, and the fungi and the other microbial activity in the soil got influenced by the glyphosate and actually killed the plant. And we, we see that um, we get evidence of, of this sort of secondary infection by the pathogens in response to the glyphosate. That's the thing that actually kills the plant. And it also, at a lower level, also uh, makes those plants more susceptible to bacterial and fungal infections and different crop diseases that are way beyond the scope of, the, of this topic. But we see it when we start crop scouting these things. So, so some of the, the rootworm infestations and the, the um, sudden death in soybeans and some other um, fungal diseases and stuff. And that all says, okay, now we're having these things. And then so the, the conventional response is, Joel, just add some more antifungals and some antibacterials. So these slides are just to show you the influence and important. Never, never underestimate the value of the soil on which we're standing. It's really fundamentally the root of, of so many things. And it's just this big, big rumen that we're standing on top of. It. Historically, we know that, that glyphosate um, if we look at sort of the some of the high points or low points, depending on your uh, affiliation, that, that in 2015, the IARC had a big meeting and announced that it was going to classify glyphosate as a probable human carcinogen. In 2015, glyphosate in California was classified as a carcinogen under their proposition. 65, which is a really interesting thing to read. They had all sorts of lawsuits based on this. And, and the initial lawsuit was, uh, was uh, Dwayne Lee Johnson. I can hardly talk about it without crying. It was tremendous. Um, and his was the first settlement. And as soon as Dwayne um, Lee Johnson's uh, settlement was made, uh, that opened the door. There were very quick settlements. Uh, af after that, and the number of lawsuits, uh, both individual and and uh, class action tort suits, have mounted. In the middle of all of this, um, uh, Bayer decided that they were going to purchase Monsanto for 66 billion with a B dollars. So we know we're not talking, you know, small potatoes as far as as corporate profits and stuff. So we. Those of you who know this story, Monsanto loses the, the suits. There were billions of dollars awarded to four plaintiffs. That was reduced to 190 million. That's being under appeal. And, um, you know, the estimated cost to bear to all of this is somewhere in the eight to ten billion dollar mark. And and even with their share price droppings and their stakeholder um, lack of confidence and that sort of stuff, when we look at the budget of these huge companies, even a, a $10 billion um, legal battle is something that gets written into the cost of doing business. So it's really hard. I mean, it gets a lot of people's attention, these lawsuits, but it, it, it may not fundamentally change the, the, the steamroller um, of these companies' activities. One of the things that happened in, in um, uh, Dwayne Lee Johnson's trial was they exposed a bunch of things in, in documents that are now known lovingly as the Monsanto papers. And, and we, we saw a lot of falsification of science. There was ghost writers by Monsanto that got other people to sign off or didn't listen to the science editors. They, they employed, quote, independent scientists to discredit people who were, were were reporting harm and doing the independent science work. They falsified data and they collaborated with the EPA um, to, to protect some of the, the corporate claims. It was a mess, it still is a mess. So right now there's 38 countries and growing with bans and restrictions on glyphosate. We also have some county, um, state, regional, city bans. We have bans on specific formulations. We have bans on specific uses. We have restrictions on other uses. We have bans on certain forms of glyphosate and glyphosate herbicide. And in some situation, these bans look really good on paper, but they don't change the larger picture. And Canada is, is a stunningly horribly good example of this situation. So if you look on, you know, the list of, oh, isn't it great? All of these countries have banned glyphosate. You know, what we find is in Canada, it's been 
planned for use by the happy homeowner. So I can't go to the store and buy glyphosate unless I have a pesticides license and all of that sort of stuff. But what they don't tell you is that um, it's the highest use for pre-harvest desiccation in, in Canada. They're using a formulation that's twice the concentration of the formulation that's available in the United States, and they're spraying at two to three to four times the um, quarts per acre limit, and they're spraying that at two to three plus times the recommended number of dosages. So, so you know, you've got to read these banned things with, with some sort of not a grain of salt, but you've just got to read the the between the lines things. Um, you know, here's some more recent data looking at the increasing use of herbicides in in, in glyphosate. Again, this doesn't have the non-agricultural use on these these tonnages. Uh, <clears throat> JAMA did a did a paper. Uh, I'm sorry, I don't have the citation on this slide, but talking at the uh, increase of exposure levels of glyphosate um, based on your, your analysis stuff uh, between, you know, the 20 years from, from uh, 1995 to, to 2015. And we, we're seeing in that, that exposure is just increasing between 20, 2015 and now. The, there's a human exposure study that was done. It was 2,500 subjects. They looked at them over three-year time. 76% of this, this cohort was positive for glyphosate. More men were positive and at higher levels than women. The people who consumed oats regularly had twice the frequency of positive tested urine tests, and, and they had twice the level of, of glyphosate. The folks that consumed 75 or so percent of their diet as organic had 80 percent fewer positives and they had a lower average level of, of of residue folks that had six plus helpings of veggies had 50 percent lower levels of glyphosate residues but the average parts per billion that that they were finding in this study was 0 0.2 parts per billion and we know that we see antibiotic effects at 0.1 parts per million and we know that we see health effects in rats at, at you know 0 0.05 parts per billion the other thing and we'll see this when we look at some data for animals uh, urines the average doesn't really tell us very much the thing that's really well it tells us a lot but the thing that's also really significant to look at is that range so we know that testing shows that glyphosate is really pervasive and we know that there's health confidence consequences at the micro and macro levels both environmentally and and within populations and and individuals and within populations of plants and and animals and humans and other species this is a reminder to i'm going to go through uh, this paper really really quickly we're going to talk about some of these effects and first effects that we were looking at we're at the macro level. And, and if you don't like seeing pictures of pig stomachs, just hide your eyes for the next few slides. And I, I wanted to put these in here because they show something that I think we see in a lot of other species. So this was a feeding study. It was the first long-term toxicology study that was done on pigs that were fed um, GMO and, and non-GMO uh, foods. And they followed these pigs all the way through from, from weaning uh, and, and, and all the way through to slaughter. They did do a lot of things right in this study and they did some things that I wish we, they could have done but couldn't for funding. But basically, they found differences in organ weights and weights of uh, ovaries and uteruses and that sort of stuff. But they also found differences in the stomach. So this is, a, this is what a normal healthy hog gut looks like. This is, this is what a, a hog gut looks like when it's fed a glyphosate-based or like a GMO feed with, with glyphosate residue in it. And you can see there's a lot of hyperemia um, and ulceration and, and redness. These look to me sort of like a mercurious stomach. This is another animal that was even more infected with, or affected uh, with the hyperemia and, and, and redness. And so you can see in those little uh, arrows, there's little pinpoint ulcerations and perforations in there. Unfortunately, this this group did not do any histopathology. They've still got the uh, they've still got the tissues, but they they don't have any histopath 
uh, studies. This is this is what happens in the confinement system where they feed antibiotics with with these guys. We still see the 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 smaller areas of hyperemia, but we still see the areas of perforation and ulceration in in these antibiotic fed hogs. So so um, when we think about that. Uh, we can, we can. For those of you hiding your eyes, we're not going to show any more slides like that for the whole presentation. But when we, when we think about what that really means and what that means in some of the things that we're seeing and diagnosing in increasing frequently, when we start looking like in horses, you know, how many horses ha are get diagnosed with ulcers? And everybody says, you, they used to say, oh, it's stress and 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 nervousness and all that sort of stuff. But but I would suggest that there's more to the story than that. We see in poultry. Um, I have a uh, I couldn't find my my really good slide, but this is a slide of a couple of uh, it was a research project that was done on a GMO non GMO feeding trial and and uh, looking at gizzards in um, looking at gizzards in birds under two different systems and so that indoor GMO bird had a big flap the floppy gizzard that didn't have a lot of muscular um, uh, capacity. Those gizzards on the left uh, are much tighter and heavier and denser, and the muscles are bigger because they're they're using themselves because they're they're not they're they're eating whole grain foods and they're eating uh, grasses and bugs and that sort of stuff. And the gizzard is the grinder, uh, the grinder part in a in a in a chicken and a turkey, and uh, um, that's what grinds up the grinds up the food before it passes it on to the passes it onto the stomach. The other thing that we found is when we strip that lining off the gizzard, that yellow lining is normal anat anatomical parts of gizzards. But what happens when, when we see these birds that are raised both in confinement and on the GMO feed, the, though that lining, instead of being plush and velvety and really convoluted, and it gets really flat and thin and when you peel that lining off, you can peel it off just like a, just like a, you know, like a face mask or something, you know. And and there's holes in those holes in that uh, that uh, protective and and uh, functional layer in the gizzards that we see with that. And we've collected thousands of these gizzards uh, linings over time now to see that's a consistent, persistent difference. And the other the other kinds of things that we're seeing with these with these uh, glyphosate contaminations in in other species is uh, botulism. And this is a pretty uh, this is a pretty exciting slide. But when it first showed up, when it non non conventional uh, botulism um, um, showed up on the scene, that's what we were seeing: barn loads of dead dead cattle. Um, just just it was it was really t totally amazing. Um, if we have lower doses of of that, we don't see as much of the effects that we see on this slide illustrated with the wasting and the and the loss of production and the death. Uh, we see wasting to a lesser extent. Uh, we certainly see the inf inflammatory response in all the organs, and we also see paralysis and paresis of of uh, body parts and one of the body parts that we see that in is the tongue and the muscles of mastication and so once you know what to look at when you go into these herds you'll see that the animals drink differently and instead of the cattle and the and the and, and the hogs and the hogs are different because we feed them on waterers and stuff but but uh the sheep and and stuff plunging their noses into the water and sucking up the water uh, like a vacuum cleaner basically is kind of how they drink we'll see them that we'll see them uh extending their heads and they start lapping they they drink more like a, a dog or it, even like a timid dog now we have to make sure when we're troubleshooting herds that they're not timid on the water because there's stray voltage and every time they touch the water they're getting an electric shock but but uh and that's an also you know that's an also uh something that we see for hesitation in drinking but it's really remarkable to see the number of cows that lap their 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 water um and and even without any overt signs of other, other clinical illness and botulism like this we weren't taught about this at vet school uh you know we weren't we weren't taught about it when i graduated and a, a lot of our, my colleagues here graduated and and for the guys who graduated after me they're certainly not being taught about that so let's talk about about measurements and stuff 
And I, I put this slide in here for context because what happens is we throw a lot of numbers around and I'm there's a lot of numbers in the rest of this presentation. And, and I want us to think about a couple of things. I want us to think about relativeness. You know, I can't conceptualize, you know, 700 billion pounds or million pounds or, you know, I get my B's and my M's mixed up. Um, when we start thinking about, you know, what does a ton of something really look like or two tons or, or a million tons really look like, it's hard to wrap our heads around that. So, so this jar of sand has a million grains in it. It's a, it's a half, it's a half gallon canning jar. There's about 5.75 pounds of sand in this. And my friend that figured this out is a geek. And so he weighed a, a known number of grains of this particular sand and you know what they weigh and he weighed them on his, he uh, loads, he loads shot, uh, you know, makes bullets and that sort of stuff. And, and he measured that on his really sensitive uh, reloading scale. And then he calculated how many pounds it would take to get a million grains. So I, I, I watched him do the math. I know the guy. This is fairly accurate math. So of this sand, there's a million grains of sand in this jar. And he built this uh, demo to explain to farmers that at two parts per million, we're seeing with mycotoxins physiologic effects. And I defy you because a lot of the farmers want to look at their, their feed and say, well, I don't see any mold in it. it it's got to be good. I defy you to figure out which two jar, grains of sand in that jar um, are red or, or, or are contaminated. So we talk about parts per million. That's one grain of sand in this half gallon jar. When we talk about parts per billion, which is a same as a nanogram per gram or a nanogram per milliliter, depending on whether you're measuring solid or fluid things. A billion is a thousand millions. So one part per billion, one nanogram per milliliter is one grain of sand in a thousand jars. And when we start talking about parts per trillion, which is, is where we're quantifying glyphosate and AMPA at some labs, not all labs, um, but some labs will quantify to that amount where actually they can find one grain in a million jars of like this, which just totally amazes me. But these are the kind of things that both we can measure, but even more significantly, these are the levels at which this substance has physiologic effect. So let's let's go and talk about glyphosate residues. I have no idea why this slide decided it wanted to do this, but in 1994, EPA said two parts per million per day was 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 okay for for life. Now they're saying now they changed their da, their their um, units a little bit, but now they're saying, oh, it's okay. You can eat 122 and a half milligrams a day if you're a 150 pound human. We need to re remember that animals are not little humans and nor are children. In 1997, we had less than, than you know, 0.1 parts per million in soybeans. Now we're seeing 20 parts per million in, in the middle of, of the last decade. Um, you know, that's a 20,000% increase. We're seeing even higher than that. It's really re routine to see 17, 20, 30 plus parts per million in, in soy. We know that we see infertility at, you know, half a part per million. Seralini did that work pretty nicely. We know we see endocrine disruption at point two and less parts per million. I'll show you some new data. We know that two parts per million glyphosate causes birth defects in, in frogs and chickens. Uh, we've got some data that would suggest that that happens in other things. Unfortunately, we see also though that the residue in the EPA, the allowable residue, is at some staggeringly high level, levels. And what we're seeing happening, there's applications right now to increase those residue levels. And, and what happens is um, the, the trade organizations and the manufacturers are saying, oh geez, we're measuring all this stuff and it's really high, so we gotta increase the residue level so that we can get some stuff on the market that's allowable. In, instead of saying, hey, wait a minute, we've got you know, super contaminated stuff here and we're just, we're just raising the bar to keep this super contaminated stuff, quote, safe in, in the larger system. 
And, and we know that glyphosate, as we said before, that glyphosate's toxic to beneficial flora at, you know, 0.1 part per million. And we know that we see liver and kidney and tissue issues at, at you know, 0 0.1 parts per billion with a B. These are the current regulatory safety limits. Depending on the authority that you read, there's different limits. And th this is the amount of glyphosate, milligrams of glyphosate per 150 pounds body weight per day. And, and so US EPA is you know, up in the stars somewhere. The, the European Union has you know, better values. Uh, California with Prop 65 is, is even lower. Uh, the Environmental Working Group suggested a, a, a child safety threshold of, of 0 0.011. And we know that we see non-alcoholic fatty liver disease in the presence of glyphosate at 0 0.011 milligrams per 150 pounds body weight. Uh, when we start looking at the data that's coming out with Oh my gosh, why are all these kids having fatty liver disease? We don't understand it. Not one person that's that's um, hollering about this on the legacy news is even looking at the, the, the growing uh, amount of data and research papers that have clear, not just correlation, but causative relationship between glyphosate-based herbicides and, um, and fatty liver disease. So we know that doses that are considered safe in, in the EU and in the United States and the UK um, uh, show statistically significant changes in physiology and 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 um, and uh, histology. We know that there's endocrine disruption in all sorts of different species. We know that there's dose-dependent alterations in the microbiome, uh, not just bacteria but fungi as well. And we know that liver and kidneys are particularly, but not solely targets of glyphosate-based herbicides. So now I just want to show you some interesting data. Um, this is, there's a tremendous project happening uh, based in Italy, but it involves a lot of different researchers in a lot of different places. It's a glyphosate, global glyphosate study. They talk about carcinogenicity, short and long-term toxicities, prenatal pre developmental toxicity, the neurotoxicities. We're seeing this toxicity extends multi-generationally. We're seeing significant endocrine disruption as well as, as anatomical disruptions, and we're seeing those microbiome changes. This is a very interesting paper that came out of the research from, from there that talks ab about the um, maternal levels of glyphosate in pregnancy in humans changing the anal genital disease um, in in infants and the anal genital disease is a, a known biomarker for endocrine disruption we see when there's changes in in that measurement that that we know that there's something in the development of that individual in which that marker is being measured that's disrupted their endocrine system we also know that that increase in anal genital disease that they found here um, was not only well, obviously a biomarker for endocrine disruption, but they also saw that that was related specifically to increased testosterone in, in the female subjects and a delayed uh, menses in the female subjects in this particular study. This is another group of, group of studies that talks about um, differences in effects that they're finding in the, in the, in the microbiome not just in, in rats and, and things, but also in human species. We also saw some um, studies, this again comes out of the global glyphosate study. They saw a statistically significant increase in the, the uh, micronuclei frequency in both male rats and female rats treated with glyphosate-based herbicides. They're, they're using a couple of different formulations of glyphosate-based herbicides in the study, which is why they have those different, um, different uh, uh, cohorts. What we find with, with micronuclei, we know very clearly, well proven, that that is a biological marker of lymphomas and leukemia in, inductions, among other cancerous things. So that gives us a lot of food, food for thought, actually. So we know that 
that um, that the glyphosate environmental exposure is generating some data. One of the things that we need to be cautious of when we look at this data and read this data and talk about this data is a lot of labs out there in the world only test to the regulatory limit. So if they say, oh, the regulatory limit is 30, anything above 30 gets reported and anything below 30 gets reported as non-detected. And what's happened in the analytical world, and it's happened for glyphosate as, as well as other things, is if there is a, a, a recommended um, dose, the, a lot of the labs, uh, because we don't have a lot of independent labs out there doing this work, um, a lot of the labs say, okay, we're only going to, oh, they set this level as the, as the average daily, allowable daily, not average daily, allowable daily intake level, let's only test to this. And, and all of that data about stuff that's lower than that level, which we've seen from, from our data set with, with allowable daily intakes um, in, in different, um, in different uh, constituencies, uh, there's a whole lot of, of stuff that we're missing if we're looking at the results from some labs. So I would really encourage people who are lab shopping, but also who are reading, reading papers about, oh, all of this glyphosate tested negative here, here, and here. I really want you to pay attention to what the limited detection that they were using and, and what they were uh, counting as, neg as negative. So we've got lots of crowdsource science and we've got lots of uh, in the lab science. 86% of the people, now this, this data here is from HRI data, 86% uh, percent, percent of, of the people that were tested have detectable limits. The, limit, the levels are up over 3,800% higher than they were 20 years ago. For the most part, dietary exposure appears to be the largest route for most people. Now, if you're a person who sprays herbicides for a living, then you know you probably have other routes of exposure in addition to what you're eating. Um, but but for most of us, certainly for most of us on the call here, um, your dietary exposure is is your your largest route. And 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 um, you know there are some occupational situations that make that higher. When we look at what's happening in animals, we found the same thing with glyphosate um, as we've found in the past with other, with other herbicides. There was some data came out in the 80s talking about total body burden studies that were done in dogs uh, versus humans, not adjusted for weight, uh, that the dogs had you know, 30 times as much uh, total body burden as, as the humans did, not adjusted for the weight of the animal. And this is about what we're, we're, what we're seeing with glyphosate, interestingly enough. So in general, dogs have about 30 times plus as much as, as they're finding in humans, and cats have about 16 uh, plus times as much as what they're finding in humans. Now the devil's in the detail here because we, we don't we have to look at the average, but we have to also look at the range. So so um, we can get a little more into the weeds with with those numbers. We see that glyphosate is really pervasive in nature. Now this is a this is a study that the guys at HRI Labs did, and they're measuring glyphosate and AMPA. Uh, AMPA is one of the the breakdown products of glyphosate. And so sometimes you'll see stuff reported as glyphosate, sometimes you'll see it reported as AMPA, and, and, then, and then they the end reports are usually given as glyphosate um, equivalents, where you combine the, the activity, the glyphosate and the AMPA, and you create a number. And, and that's a mathematical calculation that doesn't matter here, but I'm just cautioning you to look at the units when you're, that's why you see the two stripes on this graph. So you can see in these deer, you know, um, these are these are tissue samples, not urine samples. These are tissue samples. And so what happens in tissue samples, it's a really better indicator of longer term exposure. Urine can be, depending when, how we correlate it to intake, what, you know, we have to correlate that to what are they eating. But urine is like a three to five to seven to day 
day exposure. Now, if you're bucketing it in every day, you know, your urine's going to show you, you know, like you ate it last month, but, but it'll clear in the urine in a couple of days. I'll, I'll show you this. This is tissue samples. Enough said saying that we see some, you know, high, high levels, you know, up at, up at the 14 parts per, per billion. And then we see some stuff, you know, under one part per billion. So the species doesn't really make make a difference. And these were just random road kills that people scraped off off the off the road on on the way in into work. Um, these are penguins. This is a study done for some people. Uh, the scientists are in France, but the lab work came out of HRI labs again. Uh, and this is this is uh, penguins from the Antarctic. And this was a variety of samples. Uh, some of it were feathers and some of it was toenails. Um, and interestingly, this particular group of penguins was a species of penguins that didn't migrate. There's penguins in the Antarctic that swim all over the place and then they come back to the Antarctic. But this particular species of penguins were penguins that stayed in the Antarctic all the time. So they're not like you know, swimming to Australia and, and that sort of thing. And again, thinking about the food burden that, that these guys are, are getting, you know, there has to be some movement of the things that they're eating through the, through the ocean currents. So it's showing up in their feeding grounds in, in the Antarctic. It may be coming also in through, uh, you know, rain contamination and, and that sort of stuff. This is uh, the end numbers in here. This is uh, not, this is about three-year-old data, two-year-old data, um, you know, looking at the effective glyphosate levels. This is where they combine the AMPA and the, and the glyphosate and, and call it an effective glyphosate level. And they, could, they can see, you know, with over 2,000 humans, they're, they're looking here at about 0.5. Cats, N equals 5, but we're seeing about 8. Dogs, at that point, N was 69. I have a data set here we're going to talk about next where we've got 250 something animals in it. And, and horses uh, were, were up, you know, at, at 14. Now, in the next data set I'm going to show you, which is not at all neatly presented, I want to show you some problems that we see if we just talk about averages. So, so this is this is some data. These are the these are samples that came in between August 2020 and January 2023. And so there were eight eight horse samples in that. And and the there were one of those eight horses had a non-detectable, two had trace, one had 0.88, one had 1.59. One had 1.95 and one had 10. So if we if we look at the range, we're seeing non-detectable to nine. And, and then if we're looking at the average, that's gonna give us a little bit of a, it's gonna give us a little bit of a misinterpretation. With the cats, the same thing. We saw a really wide range. They saw, I, I didn't do these analytics. Um, they saw a really wide range from, from 1.15, one cat had 132.37, but most of the cats in that eight cat sample were, were you know, in, in around four to five, there was a couple at 10 and, and there was one at, one at eight. So the dogs to me are a different story and, and it could be confusing analytically, but it also I think is really hopeful therapeutically. I don't think that they have got the background information collected in the surveys that we can say this with any authority, but what they found in, what they found in the dogs is, is that the range went from non-detectable all the way up to 245.9 parts per billion or nanograms per gram liter actually because this is uh this is urine and and that was a huge range if i had been able to make you a fancy little chart what we would have found is that most of those animals are down there in the below 30 range and and even so they're even in the below 15 range that's still physiologically significant, but but it 
the, the, the fact that we're seeing this big range says to me that we can influence these values by looking at the major influencer that we're gonna have on these values in these animals is actually the food that these animals are eating. We had some conversation among ourselves and, and also with some, some colleagues here about what the heck's going on with that 245.92 uh, urine value in that dog, thinking about, you know, that's the previous um, three to five days um, exposure. And it could have been that that animal had an environmental exposure. Uh, it could have been that that animal had a single point source of a really highly contaminated something, you know, a dog chew or a treat or a biscuit. And we'll see some, we'll see some values uh, in the food here in a minute that will show us that that, that could very well be the case. So move, moving on um, and looking at some other food source. So when we look at our major food sources, the extremely highest source is the crops that are desiccated with glyphosate. These are crops that are not GMO crops. They don't, they're, they're not being, they're not in the GMO thing. So these are crops that are going to be found in products that can actually carry the GMO free sticker on it for those of you guys who, who, who read those stickers. So the, the GMO free certification um, does not mean glyphosate free because all of these really high source glyphosate crops like oats and wheat and barley and, and some of the, the seeds and sunflowers and flax, flax seeds is tremendously high, garbanzo beans are really high, um, lentils and bees and those sorts of things. You know, the owl, they call them oat, wheat and legumes. And then the, the medium high source are those genetically modified crops that have the Roundup Ready trait. So, so there's quite a list of them, but the ones that we often see in commercially prepared foods are corn and soybeans and alfalfa and sugar beets. Um, there's, there's lots of others, but when we troubleshoot, when we troubleshoot formulations and you read labels, those are the ones that need to be coming up into your food source. This is the thing, this is from Tony Mitra's work. Uh, he's got a tremendous book. He's got over a million uh, independent tests of different foods um, uh, recorded in the work that he's done. And he was one of the guys that started to see that, that the desiccation foods had much higher levels. So you look at, you know, you look at these, um, these are all non-GMO foods. They're all seed-based. And you look at, at these levels and they're just stunningly, stunningly high, physiologic and, and physical uh, issues with them. And I'm just gonna go through a whole series of lab testing now. Now you'll notice that this, um, the, the amount, the scale changed. This is the micrograms of glyphosate in a four ounce serving of, of, um, of food. And this is just a series of tests that were done. Most of this is HRI data. Some of it is from Tony Mitra's labs as well. And, and just looking at the variation between the different uh, between the different fruits and vegetables and things. So we've got cranberries. You know, one is off the off the scale, and the other's down. You know, under four. We've got blueberries that are all over the place. We've got potatoes and and uh, peach uh, and apples. Um, Here some we're seeing really high levels in teas. Uh, herb teas as, as well as, as uh, teas made from Taya, uh, bulk teas, uh, chocolate, you know, it's, it's there, but, but lower. That big horizontal line is the environmental working group level for, for children. So just to give you some context for reference so we, our heads don't explode because your head could explode really easily. And then here we are, here's a bunch of oats, whole grain oats. Um, the, the numbers are off the scale, way, way off, off the scale on, on these. <clears throat> Again, steel cut oats, um, Cheerios, you know, which one was one of the, was one of the, the problematic ones. Uh, wheat brands are very high, remembering, you know, that that's in the, this desiccation stuff gets deposited in the growing part of the, of the seeds. 
flax berries. Uh, it's interesting, you know, there's cornmeal and corn and corn flour that you would think should be on the bad guy list because it's a GMO um, and, and, and those were, were actually quite, quite low. Um, again, looking at roasted soybeans, raw soybeans, <coughs> peanut butter, lentils are quite high, um, <clears throat> chickpeas and chickpeas. And you can see the variation there because some of our chickpeas, garbanzo beans are up over, you know, are up quite, quite a bit higher than, than those levels. And again, looking at bread and, and looking at, you know, different kinds of, of, of bread. Uh, the organic whole wheat bread was, was lower than the conventional whole wheat bread, for example, in, in this sample. And again, looking at orange juices, conventional orange juices versus organic orange juices. Uh, wine had a big wide range, I'll show you in another slide. Looking at organic wine, it also had a, had a, had a range, and beer was totally all over the place. And again, that horizontal line is the environmental working group uh, recommendation for uh, children. Pet foods, um, this is one of a couple slides. We can see that it's just kind of insanely high. And we also know that a lot of dogs eat more than four ounces of pet food a day. These are, this is from uh, oat cereals. This is uh, just a, amalgamated data to show that it can be all over the place. Uh, significantly higher than the environmental uh, working groups, child health safety recommendations, but all over the place. Same, same with beans. Same with wines. And, and uh, this is, this is, um, organic samples that are very interesting. And, and so when we start seeing these kinds of levels in organic samples, so, sort of things, you know, when you're troubleshooting, looking at this, we have to determine, you know, is this actually somebody who set out with an, an intent to defraud the, the uh, National Organic Program? And there's been quite a bit of stuff happening lately. Uh, you know, great lawsuits and unfortunately suicides around some in-country farmers that were that were selling um, uh, non-organic stuff and and falsely having it labeled as organic. And there's lots of stories about you know a boat leaves a port in pick a country and by time the time it leaves the port and by the time it docks in North America, suddenly that whole load of produce is or that whole load of uh, commodity has been mystically and mystically certified organic. So, so we do see, uh, you know, we do see that. We also see some situations where there's been where there's been drift. And so, one of the things that I have difficulty with in this in the National Organic Program is it's a pre prescriptive program. It says, oh, if you don't do all these things, then your food is quote safe or clean or pure or whatever. But there re really isn't anything that's happening on a large scale basis where we're actually testing the, these residues in organic foods for glyphosate and for other pesticides to see whether or not that is that presumption is really, really true. So here's a little bit of stuff about eating it. And, and these are, this is uh, some small but not insignificant studies that I want to show you that, that talk about the dynamics of, of what happens to glyphosate what happens to glyphosate when you eat it, because that's going to be the biggest, biggest, biggest thing when we start talking about remediating this. Um, so, so this is John Fagan. He's the, he's the co-founder and, and chief scientist at, at um, Health Research Institute. And he decided he was going to do a pee in the cup study and, and he was going to do, you know, do glyphosate. And he decided what he was going to do was preload himself with, um, with Quaker oats. So he ate five days of, of Quaker oats for breakfast. Exactly, exactly what you see there, you know, a, a not, you know, a regular old bowl of Quaker oatmeal. And, and then he, he ate the, the rest of his diet, which is essentially a um, 100% organic diet. And so this was, this is John, like by day five on organic, uh, um, on the, on the uh, Quaker oats. And this is him eating his usual organic oats. So this is, this is the, after a couple days of five days of loading, he peed in the cup. These two lines, one is glyphosate and one is AMPA. So, so he loaded for five days, ate his regular diet, except for his breakfast that you saw him eating with his Quaker oats oatmeal. And, and that's what happened. 
So by day two of quitting to eat it, you can see that things went down, 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 down. And then what happened with this little blip is a bunch of fellow scientists came into town and they all, or he was traveling, something, one of those two things, but he went out for dinner at one of the chain Italian restaurants and, and had a meal there. And that's what happened. And, and then after his meal, um, you know, after his meal, things, things reverted back down to quite low. This is a toxicokinetic um, experiment. You'll notice here, they're hard to see on this slide, and the, on the, um, the, the scale is different here. So we're at, at 0.35 on the, on the left-hand scale. Uh, this is, this is um, with a, with a um, um, not paying so much attention to what the content of the food is, but having eaten certified organic food, um, but but without paying, you know, without paying con uh, con con uh, paying attention to the uh, to the diet as far as you know, am I actively looking to avoid those those foods that we know are high in in, in glyphosate? And just looking at how when we stop eating this stuff, it goes down. So the three main sources to reiterate are the GMO crops that source is much, much, much less problematic than the crops, the grains and the beans and the seeds and stuff that are being used pre-harvest desiccation. And then there's the perennial crops, the fruit and the berries and coffee and tea and, and cocoa and, and that, that sort of stuff. So we know this, lots of contamination. We found it in lots of amounts where we didn't expect to see it. We, we, the general scientific community, the, the, the analytical community, it's become a big contaminant of concern. Um, you know, I would think after the lawsuit stuff that's been happening, that it would be a real liability for, for the, the food companies. And also, um, when people start testing, it's a big piece of mud in the eye for companies, um, you know, when they when they say, oh, my gosh, this was in Quaker Oats or this was in, you know, Sun Chips or this was in so and so's wine. Uh, organic is is better, but it's not immune. And and, you know, there's been a lot of bad mouthing of the organic brand and then and the national organic plan uh, around this pesticide contamination stuff. So the market responds in different ways. Some people just put their head in their sand and say, fine. Or some people put their head in the sand and say, well, I'm organic and it doesn't matter. So, cause, cause we don't have pesticides. Um, some people are, are beginning, some companies are beginning to remove uh, s contaminated ingredients, both from their recipes and their supply chain. Um, so that's the word on the street. It's a risk management thing. And it's also placing themselves in a, you know, in a good place in the competitive market. There are some labeling efforts and certification levels that are they're there. I just have to emphasize to you all that GMO free doesn't mean glyphosate free. We need to really think of, about that. And the grain dealers are beginning to consider how to control for the glyphosate. And so what's happening in a lot of the grain markets, they say, oh, we don't desiccate with glyphosate, but what they're, what they're doing is they're desiccating with paraquat instead. And I hate to have the worst contest, you know, the worst pesticide in the world contest, but um, I am unconvinced that using Paraquat is any benefit at all over using glyphosate. And, and there's a million and six products out there saying that, that, oh, I, you know, take this and, 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 you know, you don't, you're not having uh, glyphosate. This is a fledgling certification that's happening right now, uh, open to organic and non-organic people, where where they're um, looking at testing things on the on the shelf or in the supply chain, not only for glyphosate but for a whole panel of different different pesticides and veterinary drug residues and antibiotics. So I'm hoping you know I'm hoping that gets some traction in the market. So <clears throat> pet food. Here's a little bit more data um, looking at. You know, when 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 we look at the far left about the 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 working group le levels, we look at organic foods on the not quite far left, and we we start looking at you know the the uh, different the different um, dry foods. The next slide is going to be almost impossible, probably for you to read on this side of screen, but it's a whole bunch of consolidated data that was some work from. Uh, 
uh, Stephanie Seneff's group and uh, uh, Sample and Seneff's group, and some of it, uh, with a lot of some of their work came from Tony Mitra's data, and some of this is data from HRI Labs. And I'm here to tell you, there's just some stunningly amazing uh, differences in 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 pet foods, um, and that I think we could have a lot of fun exploring that. Dermal contact is another thing. We know that people that are using this stuff, so farmers, uh, land managers, uh, groundskeepers, those kinds of guys, they, they've got 10 plus times the level of glyphosate in their body um, um, than, than folks who use gloves. And then there's a step down from, from people who, who use gloves versus people who eat this stuff. And so we, we really don't know what's going on uh, kinetically with, you know, what kind of influence do we have with animals who are, who are grooming and getting in through their, through their paws. And um, we, we're not sure how that affects those data. We're looking at, we, the scientific community, looking at paired urine samples and hair testing samples and, and hoping that that might help discern that because what you'll see is the hair test is reflective of a much longer exposure and the urine test is reflective of the much shorter exposure. And when we pair those things together, we can sometimes tell a story. In, in a lot of species that have hair, long hair, as opposed to shorter hair, we can do it in shorter hair, species too, but we can take like a centimeter chunk of the hair and then a centimeter uh, closer to the root. Or if, if somebody with longer hair, you know, if they've got six inch long hair, we can say, oh yeah, we can use the relative growing uh, uh, rate of growth for the species that we're dealing with and start making some comments about, well, this is what happened in exposure. There's a lot of thought. I, I've had a lot of discussion with John Fagan about this lately, and we're wondering whether um, hair is acting as a as a safety reservoir to get this, the the glyphosate out of active circulation and into a, a safe place. So the reality is, glyphosate's really water soluble. Bodies want to pee it out, and and left to their own devices. And if we stop the inflow, they're going to pee it out. And 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 I I'm beginning to wonder whether hair is a good place to sequester glyphosate. And then we start looking at dynamically, well, what happens in species that really shed their hair seasonally or, or like birds, you know, like those penguins that, that, that molt. And so they might have a whole lot of glyphosate in their hair at saving the rest of the physiology because it's relatively bound in there. And, and then they molt and yeah, it makes environmental contamination, but for the, for the, the individual physiology, it, it, it might quote, save things or buffer, buffer things. And that's one of the things that, that uh, that we're ex exploring there. So what can we do in the last you know five minutes here or so? First of all, don't spray it. Like honest to Pete, you know, use your voice and your dollar and advocate for change. Just and that could that could be all consuming. If I did nothing else in my life, um, but but glyphosate research and and policy and activism stuff i could fill all the days i mean I, I could fill all the days just reading the stupid papers that are coming out now the other thing is don't eat it you know everybody gets all in a big flap about it and and rightly so but honest to pete don't eat it let's learn to read labels let's understand that we don't find this stuff in meat um i was really disappointed to hear that personally you know i thought that that oh my gosh what a what a thing you know the animals are going to eat it and they're going to they're going to sequester it in their meat and some early studies that that were done using a different way of analyzing for glyphosate uh, suggested that that might be so but honestly they're looking now and and looking at parts per trillion they cannot find glyphosate in in meat milk or eggs at parts per trillion they have found some in liver um, and that seems to be related to, uh, ha, ha, there's not enough research data to show this yet, but it seems to be related to, you know, when, when in, the, in the timeline did they eat it? Um, and, and the problem with doing glyphosate research in lab animals is that most lab animals get fed Purina, Purina lab chow 
as the um, as the control and purina lab chow has got a whole bunch of glyphosate in it too so so learning how to learning how to shop so so people get all excited about avoiding gmos and and i'm not trying to tell you to eat gmo corn or 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 gmo soy because i think there's a lot of problems with that in and of itself but i think if we're going to avoid something i think the thing that we really need to avoid are those products that are being desiccated and we see in animals, particularly in companion animals, um, there's this really big move to, everybody got excited about corn and soy, right? So now we have to make grain-free food. And so when we make grain-free food, what's the thing that we put in the food on those recipe labels? And the thing that we put in the food are, are sometimes potatoes, usually beans, peas, some kind of legume. And, and when we think about that for a bunch of reasons, uh, it's physiologically inappropriate for a cat to eat food that is based like that. Cats are basically carnivores and the veggies that they eat come out of the guts of the stuff that they they take and a little bit of self-medicating if they're if they're able to go out and and you know graze on a on a diverse sward of of veg, uh, plants and herbs. So so that in itself is a problem. So I think we have physiologic issues when we start feeding cats like they're little dogs. But but also when we start looking at the amount of glyphosate that we see in these things, I think that's a huge problem. I think it's a huge problem in humans. So for example, you know, the the really cutting edge cardiac care clinics, you know, are putting people on a plant based diet and and, you know, they want to feed them lots of legumes and fresh veggies and and minimal meat and which which I'm not going to argue that philosophy here and, you know, minimal fat and, and that sort of stuff. But all of the things that they're recommending all the way from the oatmeal uh, through to the legumes and stuff. Um, are are hugely, hugely, hugely contaminated with, with glyphosate. Try and avoid contact, try and wash, think about where it is in the environment. Yeah, I know when we wash it, it goes down the drain and goes somewhere else. And so this is where, you know, we're all sitting in the same nest here, guys. So that's where where we go back to, you know, I go back, I'll be a very happy person when 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 we even further restrict the use of glyphosate. And, and that, you know, so trying to make those informed kind of choices. How do we shop? Meat and milk generally isn't an issue. I can give you all sorts of other reasons beyond glyphosate to look for proper grass-fed, grass-finished meats, uh, organic dairy, grass-fed dairy. I, I can give you all sorts of reasons to do that. But if you're if you're not buying meat because you're afraid there's going to be glyphosate in it, um, that's that's not an issue. And if you're not buying milk because you're afraid there's going to be glyphosate in it, that's not an issue. Uh, the center aisle stuff tends to be high, you know, the processed foods and and that sort of stuff. Produce varies. It varies with the um, you know, as you saw from some of the some of the data. I mean, it's used in orchards, it's used in vineyards, it's used in berry places um, for weed control. So there's all sorts of drift with that. We do have a couple of genetically modified produces, um, so so uh, papayas and and um, zucchini squashes. The other pro produce that it tends to be quite high in are the vining things like pumpkins and squashes and melons and that sort of stuff. And the reason that it's high in that is because they spray those crops with glyphosate, not not often at the very first pass through the field. But but um, at some point in the harvest cycle, they will spray those crops with glyphosate. Even the non-GMO uh, zucchinis, they'll spray with glyphosate because it kills off all the vines, and you can see what what fruit is left there to be harvested. So some of those, uh, like I say, pumpkins and 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 melons and um, squashes and uh, and those sorts of things can have a pretty high um, glyphosate load. The organic stuff varies. It varies with the integrity of the supplier, um, and it varies with with you know fraud stuff. Um, but but if you look across the board, um, uh, these are these are paired samples. Um, I they're blinded to me. I don't know what the products are, but they're paired comparing organic versus conventional. We see a lot more of that. 
when we talk about remediation, um, I'm not here to tell anybody how to run their practice. Testing is a huge part. You know, it's great to monitor progress as well as getting a baseline. If somebody only has a finite amount of money to spend, I don't think it makes a darn bit of sense to be eating a diet that you know is high in glyphosate and go pee in a cup and see what's there. Like you, you know, it's high. And, and so you could save one of your test dollar amounts by, um, by making the changes in the diet and then seeing how well did we go. Uh, just to finish up here, there's special needs supplements, particularly around mineral nutrition. Even though the stuff may be present in, the minerals may be present in analysis, they're not biologically functionally available. Lots of probiotics and prebiotics to, to introduce and reintroduce the friendlies and support those friendlies, but it's not going to do you any good. Like taking prebiotics and probiotics and special needs supplements and continuing to eat glyphosate is not going to work. It's just, you're just propping stuff up. It's, it's just not going to work. You know, it's, it's a total obstacle to the progression of things. And the other thing that we really need to do in the remediation is, is to reduce the inflammatory response in the individual. And there's lots of ways to do that. You know, that's where things like the grass-fed, grass-fed meats, the grass-fed dairy, that that sort of that sort of thing uh, works. Every single one of these remediation tactics work, uh, whether you're dealing with soil, whether you're dealing with animals, and whether you're dealing with whether you're you're dealing with plants. So um, we covered a bunch of ground. Um, I'm happy to, and we started late because of technical crap, but I'm happy to take questions now or at the end of things. I do want to say that um, John Fagan has, has extended, um, we're getting the details, worked, the logistical details worked out, but the offer's clearly on the table. He's, he's really interested in working with professionals in, in, crowdsourcing some of this data and information and also getting the, the the knowledge of how do we test and how do we interpret tests appropriately out in the world uh, both for glyphosate and for some other things and and he has um, extended an offer to both the both the ABH and also to the Illinois homeopathic medical uh, association members for discounted rates on testing at the lab He'll discount um, any of the glyphosate testing, regardless of substrate, urine, urine, blood, uh, food, uh, soil, any of that stuff will discount at 10% off list. And any of the other diagnostic capacity in the lab, uh, he'll offer it to you guys at a 15% discount. So just putting that out there, we can certainly talk about that later. So thank you very much for your patience where we did tech work and your, and your, um, and your attention during this conversation. Any questions out there? Yes, we have a question, Dr. Susan, um, on the webinar by Joletta. Yeah, so she has, hi, Joletta. Yes, uh, she has two questions. One, you'll have to go all the back to slides uh, 50 or so. Uh, the question was, were the cats indoor, outdoor, or random? So I think... Yeah. I don't know the answer. <clears throat> I don't know the answer to that, and that's 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 a thing that deeply saddens me because when we were talking we the lab you know back hri lab was built by the by the community uh it was funded by individual donations uh by by you and me and 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 individuals and businesses because they wanted an individual testing lab uh that that wasn't biased and and was really interested in finding out the answers even if the answers might be unsavory. And when they first started doing glyphosate testing, I said, you know, we really need to consolidate this and do some questions um, on the part of the people submitting, whether the veterinarians are submitting or whether the, the pet owners are submitting, so that when we get a whole bunch of data like this, then we're gonna be able to answer those questions. And what I haven't done yet, uh, Joletta, is I don't have, um, I, I don't, this is one of the projects that that I'm I'm working on with um, with John and the folks at HRI now is looking to see if we have anybody who actually filled out any surveys about these guys and if we have the capacity to perhaps go backwards uh, by going back to the actual humans who who submitted the test to get some retroactive information if that information wasn't there. So I don't know that answer. Okay. Yeah. I mean that would be a great thing to know. Plus. 
when you were mentioning about you know the grain free and now seeing how much desiccants used on all these yep. grains, it's it's so hard to find you know good healthy diets for these animals. Um, right. And are, are you do you have you know names of places where they have the good grass fed finished yes. sources yes. of foods? Oh yes, I I that's that's one of my favorite topics in the whole world and. And uh, you know, I'm happy to share that with you, or I'm happy to I'm happy to share it with a larger larger group. You can just shoot me an email and shoot that me would be great. And talk about that it. Would be great. And, and I'm also happy to share what kind of questions can you ask to a farmer um, so that that you that you know they're not trying to who do you. You know, most of them aren't. The larger corporate guys are trying to who do you, um, and some of the greenwashing corporate guys that you know that are um, that are trying to you know like like produce pastured chicken and that sort of stuff you know they're trying to hoodoo you but but uh, that's my personal opinion um but but yeah sourcing sourcing can be really hard and food sourcing can re be really hard and it's my hope certainly if we can do it retro retrospectively we can do it moving forward with some pointed questions about diet in these submissions and that i would encourage anybody who's submitting glyphosate testing either on your personal behalf or or for families or your personal pets or your clients' pets or whatever, is, is that we get as much of that data as possible because that's gonna make us, give us the ability to make some, you know, we can do science faster <clears throat> that way. Okay. So, I don't know how to hand you back the uh, stop screen sharing. I had, uh, Dr. Susan, we have one more question from Joletta. Oh, yes. She's hey, requesting uh, uh, slide 82 to be put up again. Those are the names of the brands you said we wouldn't be able to read, but I, she will, I will see if I can get that slide to you in a different form. Okay, and then we do have questions from uh, Dr. Tom and Dr. Laurie, so I'm going to unmute them. Let's see if, yeah, and Dr. Tom. I don't know how to ask a question here. Hello, can anyone hear me? I gotcha. All right. I was just wondering if there's a way to get a glyphosate test sent to us, or if there's a kit we can buy, or if there's something over the counter we can do to test our animals and ourselves. Yeah, uh, health health resources labs, uh, hri.org. Dot org, okay. H no, hri labs dot org. Uh, and, hri labs dot org. Uh, yep, yeah, and they've got they've got the glyphosate testing. I would encourage you. Uh, right right now, they have a, a professional relationship with clinicians where you can pre buy like pre buy and and for your clinic to hand out to your clients for use in their patients uh they they do do a discount for that sort of bulk pre-buying um but and and if you're going to do if you're an academy member or a, or a uh, illinois homeopathic medical association member you know they'll do that glyphosate testing for you at at 10 percent discount but but those are those are urine they'll do urine they'll do hair uh they'll do food they'll do uh compost they'll do manure but hrilabs.org and they, they they test their limit of their limit of uh, they they've got a really sensitive test specific and sensitive. Okay. Thank you. We do have a few uh, more questions. Okay. I'm asking Dr. Laurie. Hi, this is Dr. Lori Lofton. Can you hear me? Yep, I gotcha. Hi, uh, so you answered my question. Thank you, Susan, with the last question. Good. Yeah, thank you so much for this talk. You're welcome. We have a, question, in -house. We have a question in house too, but go ahead okay. and once you're done with those, and we'll then uh, Francine has a question in house. Okay, I'm unmuting uh, Dr. Um, Sharon. Dr. 
Dr. Sharon? She's gone. <clears throat> I think so. I, I resend the request. Oh, she's gone now. Maybe she's having the same woes at her end as me. <laughs> Dr. Sharon? No, I think she's not there. Okay, she, she can get, you can get back with me by, by email. Um, I think I'm sending the stuff back to you too at your end, the Illinois crew, my screen I'm sending back to you. Okay, thanks. We have a question here, Francine uh, has a question for you. Uh, Susan. Okay. Hi, Francine. Hi, Susan. Can you hear me? Uh, not quite. Okay. Come a little closer, dear. Okay, should I go up there? Yeah, yeah I know, and I know this is a favorite topic of yours. Oh, yeah, it is a favorite topic of mine. I have a couple of questions regarding, if I understood correctly. Are you saying that the, um, in terms of testing and not testing in here, am I, I have several questions. Are you... Um, are we assuming that this is a water soluble toxin? We know it's, we're not assuming, we know it's water soluble. Okay, so I mean, that would make sense if it's water soluble um, to detox from it. I'm, and this is a general question, you know, because I had headaches for 30, 35 years and I'm talking to Kim Alia, and he suggested that I take glycine and liposomal vitamin C, and in three days I was done with my headaches. That could be very true. Okay, so um, if glycine can help detoxify it, drinking a lot of water can help detoxify it. When you're testing, you're, the, the urine I would, I would think would be, since you can't test for hair because it doesn't go in the hair like a heavy metal would, um, the urine sounds, I, I don't understand all the different so tests. The, the, the glyphosate testing is, is really complicated and and we make it sound easy here. And I am i am not the queen of bench science chemistry anymore. I, I was a pretty good queen of bench science bacteriology and microbiology, but bench science chemistry was not. And some of this has, so so I'm gonna, when they, when they do the glyphosate testing, part of the, part of the mechanics of the actual testing, like in, in we're in the weeds now, but when they do that, they actually correct for the specific gravity of the urine that's tested so that 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 they have a they have a um, validated formulation for correcting for the specific gravity because if you've got a water soluble something and you've got a specific gravity that's high versus a specific gravity that's low or even you know one of the things that we've been talking about is the differences in species normal specific gravities you know between cats and people or for example and, and that sort of stuff okay but, but in a larger in the, your larger part of of your question perhaps unasked is you know when we talk about quit eating it one of the other things is is to you know jack up your water intake because because it it wants to it wants to move in water and and so um, jacking up your water intake can can really help. Okay, so b b besides that, I'm ki I'm kind of making an assumption here. If I have a, a a person who is not doing organic and I'm not sure about their diet, can I do a presumptive test to tell people to take? So for me, the glycine, for example, is um, was was definitely a problem. The, the glyphosate and the glycine seem to displace that with vitamin C, but if I could try that with a human being to do a, a trial run to see what symptoms may disappear and then have them eat organic. I don't, I, I think, I think there, I think, I think we're having the, con we could have the conversation on several levels. I mean, if you want to try that, you know, try it, but it's not necessarily going to prove anything other than, other than for that for that person, they shared your same response that that glycine and and vitamin C made their headaches go away. What, what we, there's 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 been a 
there's been a lot of um, there's been a lot of um, well, there's been a lot of papers written and there's been a lot of conversation had about this whole relationship about you know does does glyphosate dis displace glycine and and if we just flood the system with glycine is it going to push the glyphosate out and and that sort of stuff and and there's been some um there's been some data that's been generated to suggest that might be the case there's been some data that's been um that's been uh combed from the literature to suggest that might be the case um, but there's also been some clinical data that's been generated that that uh, refutes that and so um, I'm just trying to remember the second author on the paper uh, and, and, um, that that talks about the, that um, that glyphosate um, that glyphosate um, glycine issue so you so so the question that I would have is from from the clinical thing yeah that could work um, from the, the the more science thing is you because you don't have a baseline you don't know where things are right like so that that could be a that could be a person you know we got people that eat this stuff and and may not accumulate it as much as the next person so if you've got somebody who's got issues with glomerular filtration rate or something like that they're going to accumulate at a higher rate than than somebody that doesn't and and so what we don't know yet um, is if we right now the diet is a variable and the individual human is a variable what we haven't got a lot of work on right now is if we have an individual a room full of individual humans and they're all eating the same diet then how what what's the what's the pharmacokinetics of this substance in that individual so yeah, you could do that clinically, but to come out the other end and say, I cured that lady's glyphosate toxicity with this, my personal opinion um, is you're on, you know, you're on, you're on wobbly ground. Um, I know a lot of people, if we're, you know, some people are curious where, where, what their levels are, even in the face of a diet that we know that their levels are going to be high. But what we and what we don't know really well is if I have two people in the same family that eat everything the same, you know, are they going to pee out the same amount of glyphosate? I don't know that. I don't think anybody knows that. Okay. Okay. Well, for for me, the bottom line is these companies should be put out of business. And I'm <laughs> I'm, I'm I'm mentally and emotionally done with trying to prove things scientifically anymore. There's a degree to which this stuff. I mean, right. it's beyond common sense, but so, so probably that put, aside, that put aside for me is, you know, the glyphosate is one poison in the food. I've seen aspartame as another poison in the food. So until yep. we have a society and we have corporations that aren't making money and being allowed to because they're poisoning people and get away with it. And that's a whole nother uh, it's taken to the extreme in our society today, obviously, because it's infiltrated what's considered good medicine. Um, yes, it's a poison. You've proven it's a poison. There's data out there. And how much? I mean, we're going to so sign. I think, I think from. I think from. I think there. I think there's parallel conversations here. So, so I think if. I don't disagree with anything that you've said, at all. I, I think that there's parallel conversations though. And so part of the conversation would be how do we how do we wool these companies? And this may be a larger conversation than you guys want to go to today, but but briefly, you know, is tort law and lawsuits going to wool the companies? Well, if you've got a company that it, they they just blew off spending ten billion dollars on defending, you know, three or four tort mass tort suits, and and they've written that into the operating expenses for their company as many other companies have you know look at the feminine hygiene product company or the the you know there's all sorts of them we could just go down the go down the grocery shelves or the shopping shelves and 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 that's part of the cost of doing business for these companies so so you know the question is are the courts a viable way and in some ways yeah it chips away at things but then when we start looking and saying, okay, what are the other ways that we can make change? And so, so for you, if you're 
if your priority is putting the companies out of business, then we start looking and saying, okay, how do we do that? So we, we shine light on things that hitherto haven't had sh light shone on them, you know, the Ponsanto papers, for example. We, we work in our regulatory capacity um, by saying, okay, the, the allowable limits used to be here, but now they're here. So, so let's start to look at that science-based stuff and then to work with legislators first because we have to have the legislation in order to build the, the regulation. You can't build a regulation in the United States and there, unless there's legislative authority to build that regulation. So, so that goes back up to you know being politically active, which is a pain in the ass sometimes. But but that you know, so that and then the other way that we can go at it is is looking at transparency so that everybody out there can see you know that the emperor really doesn't have any clothes. And for some people, those testing programs can can be really great like we know it's bad and how much more science do we need to to know to say it's bad and all of that stuff i i i get that argument um but and and then and then so we've got enough science that we can start to make comments about what's a safe relatively safe glyphosate level in food for example and and then if we have widespread robust testing programs then we can have people say, okay, I, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put my dollar into buying these foods and I'm going to put my, I'm gonna put my um, you know, my emphasis into not buying those other foods. And it's going to let people do things, two things. It's going to let them make a choice when they don't have to be as scientifically educated as perhaps you are. And, and it's also going to show the companies that are making these products that this is where we want to spend our money. And so the same thing's going to happen as happened like with the recombinant BST in, in milk. You know, the company that bought it and thought it was going to be a big cash cow, you know, and we're going to put it in all these dairy cows, they, they ended up selling it to somebody else because it didn't make them any money. I mean, it, it got them a lot of bad press, but it didn't make them any money. And so they changed the label on the use of it and they sold it to another company and, and, and it didn't turn into be their cash cow. So, so there's that happening, and then parallel to that, there's stuff happening like, like the work that my friend Howard Bleeger, the guy who, the guy who, who started the pig study way back when, you know, Howard, Howard's working really hard with a product right now that has is licensed in some use and not quite licensed in other uses. Um, that's a that's a um, that's an herbicide, a, a, a knockdown herbicide that is going to replace glyphosate be, because it'll you know we can we can we can spray it for for lots less money than glyphosate and it kills stuff better than glyphosate does um and and uh and without that toxic stuff and indeed uh it improves the uh soil microbial and 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 functional value actually it, you know after it's been sprayed a while and Bob Kramer the guy who did the Bob Bob's retired now from the U USDA in, in in Missouri and he's working uh, in his retirement doing some analysis on that product so we've got all these parallel things and so I think for each of us individually you know we got to we got to decide what's the most effective use of our time and energy and if if doing pure science either doesn't interest you or 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 frustrates you because oh my god we've done this already like let's just get on with it then then i would suggest that the most effective use of your time and energy would be you know maybe educating your clients in your private practice and doing some of the remediation stuff and then deciding where you want to be in in the activist you know either legislative activist stuff or promoting some of these testing program kind of stuff that'll that would probably keep you happier in the long run and we we need to move you know we need to move all those things forward to make change okay thank you and i'm happy to talk to you about this or type to you about it because it because you i mean I get frustrated to tears, just to tears. You just want to throw up your hands in dismay and not eat anything. And I've been doing work on other pesticides and you really want to throw up your hands in dismay and because you don't know what to eat, you know? <laughs> we have a few more questions on the webinar. Uh, should I go ahead? 
you, you tell me how to want to use your time. If you want to do the AK stuff first and then circle back to this at the end, I'm happy. I, I, I don't have preference. You, I'll let you guys tell me. You want to start AK or do you? And if there are any more questions, do them at the end or what? Okay, so in the interest of time, instead of taking a 10 minute break, we're going to go straight to our next lecture. But first of all, how about a round of applause? For our last speaker, Dr. Beal, just fantastic. It's like Thanks. It was it was fun. So I'd like to introduce Dr. S. Rahil Haq and um, NDDC, I might add, and he's going to be enlightening us on utilizing applied kinesiology to prescribe the correct home gathering remedy. Isn't that like the hardest thing we do. I mean, how can we find the right remedy? That's always what we're looking for. So take it away, Rahil. Thank you, Bob. Um, let's see, let's share this. Yep. Oh, yeah, this one and that one. Ah, okay, this works. Great. Thank you. Uh, thank you all for having me. Um, first, I wanted to speak a little bit about um, my own practice, how I practice, so you have an idea of how I'm utilizing this tool um, of applied kinesiology in order to prescribe or select the correct remedy. Uh, I run a practice called Vitacore Holistic. I've been in uh, cash practice for the last five years now. Um, and in general, my first visit is about an hour long. That includes a physical exam, the treatment, um, diagnosis, and then follow-ups are around 30 minutes. So as you can see, it's not the typical uh, classical homeopathic uh, time frame for uh, selecting a remedy and, and doing the intake. Uh, so it's it's a little bit more rapid, and I and, and I uh, give the credit to Applied Kinesiology for allowing me to uh, have that speed in prescribing remedies. Some of the main treatment modalities that I utilize are uh, spinal manipulation, extra spinal manipulation, cranial manipulations, uh, nutrition, and obviously uh, homeopathy. Generally, whatever the patient comes in with, if something lines up better with them, then I utilize that. If something comes up very clearly homeopathically in my mind, then I'll give a, a remedy in those cases. So what is AK or applied kinesiology? Uh, it's really just a diagnostic tool, right? So it allows you just like a CT scanner, X-ray, MRI, ultrasound. It allows you to see what's going on in the body. And the beauty of this tool is that it doesn't does not require a multi-million dollar facility in order to utilize, right? Um, nor does it require a huge amount of uh, training in order to utilize. You can be, you know, what I explain to my patients is that you can be upside down, blindfolded in a third world country and treating with your hands and assessing things just with your hands, right? Sometimes eyesight is helpful, so if the blindfold's not on, that would be good. So it's really just a diagnostic tool, to see what's going on with the body. And we're gonna go through a little bit about how this diagnostic tool is utilized allows you to get to the origin of a health issue. So let's say um, a patient comes in and we can find out using applied kinesiology testing or symptoms or just simple observation that there may be multiple organ systems that are not functioning properly, right? The kidney, the spleen, the stomach. How do we know if one organ is causing the other issues, right? If there's a primary, secondary, and tertiary. What was really important is really just to find out what the primary organ is, because once you correct that, if it's the spleen, it may correct the other two organs, right? So in applied kinesiology, there is a method of figuring out which organ is going to be the most important. And um, as we know in homeopathy, there are certain remedies that are particular to, um, that have a particular action towards a certain uh, organ or organ system. Um, and we can use belladonna, for example, as cardiac, right? Aconite can be used as a cardiac remedy as well. Um, and we can't, you know, uh, narrow down each remedy to a particular organ or organ system. And if we end up doing that, then we may falsely prescribe a remedy or we may come very close and say, you know what, since it's a heart issue, I'm not going to use these remedies because they're used in, you know, for other organs or organ systems. So we have to be very broad and open as Hahnemann was and uh, be very objective with uh, figuring out which remedy to utilize. Um, so applied kinesiology does allow you to figure out where the, or it assists in finding out where the origin of a health problem is. Uh, applied kinesiology was founded by Dr. George Goodhart, who's actually a graduate of this university here, National. Um, his picture is in the, the Hall of Fame uh, in the main Jancy Hall. 
uh, on the right hand side, a few, few uh, pictures down. And he founded Applied Kinesiology in the year 1964. Um, and from that point forward, it has been advancing through research and, and different developments. What he did is he um, was a very uh, voracious reader. And uh, one of his students, who's my mentor, Dr. Uh, Lou Boven, actually said that he had so many books in his house that he that the walls were were filled and he would have to put stack books on their sides on the book on the uh, on the staircase going up and these weren't just books that he got gifted or he bought and he never read these were books that were earmarked and highlighted and noted in so he's a very voracious reader his father was also a chiropractor so he had access to a lot a number of diagnostic tools as soon as he started his practice from his father um, what he did is he amalgamated a number of different sciences, uh, you know, traditional Chinese medicine, physical medicine, chiropractic, osteopathic, cranial work. And he took all of these uh, different um, modalities of treatment and he founded and put together a method where you can easily figure out, you can train someone to figure out what's going on in the system. Okay, and it'll, it'll make a little bit more sense as we move forward. And I'm not going to go over the whole entire system. The goal of this presentation is to give you all a tool that you can utilize today, tomorrow, almost immediately um, in order to assist you in figuring out which remedy, if you're between three to five remedies, how to quickly and rapidly figure out which remedy is going to have the biggest neurological response in the human body. Um, two of his students, Dr. Goodhart, two of his senior students who actually worked with him for the longest period of time were Dr. Lou Boven and Dr. Al Zatkin. And like I said earlier, I studied under Dr. Lou Boven. Um, I'm specifically in this uh, presentation speaking about classical applied kinesiology, the way that Dr. Goodhart, Dr. Boven, Dr. Zatkin did it. As many of you have, have, have any of you in this room at least heard, heard about applied kinesiology? I know. Dr. Burke, yep, okay, so everyone here. Um, you may know that there's traditional classical applied kinesiology, just like there's classical homeopathy, and then you have a number of offshoots of people doing different types of testing modalities, um, different ways of testing, um, which in my personal opinion, I have not found to be as accurate um, as classical applied apply kinesiology, which takes a little bit longer in order to train in and to learn, but I have found that uh, the results uh, are worth the extra training uh, and extra diligent time and effort that are required to learn them properly. So in applied kinesiology, you see on the right-hand side over here, we have the, uh, this, this is the logo for, for applied kinesiology. I'm going to have you all focus on the triangle, blue triangle in the background. That's called the triad of health. You have three main uh, factors that cause disease in the body. And these are probably outlet, you know, outlined in the organon. Um, Dr. Shepherd probably has them by memory. So where they are in the organon, but you know, simply it's biochemical or chemical. That's anything you eat, drink, breathe in, put on your skin can all affect you in a chemical manner. You have mental, emotional, right? Traumas from a young age moving forward. And then you have at the base, you have structural, anything from twisting your ankle to getting into a car accident, right? So all of these things are interconnected. Your structure can affect your biochemical. So if you get into a car accident, you jam your skull really hard against the, the dashboard. What happens, your temporal bone may be jammed. You may find some tenderness on palpation. That temporal bone um, rotation may actually cause tension on the vagus nerve and the cervical region, which is going to cause digestive issues, which is going to make that, you know, whatever food you just consumed on the biochemical level not absorb properly. So all of these are interconnected. Uh, we're not going to focus on the other points. Um, so let's talk about the variables. These are like the check engine signs that that I utilize in my practice in order to assess how patients are doing and um, to to assess how a remedy is acting or interacting with their with their nervous system. So we have the neurolymphatic points. These are also called Chapman points. Has anyone ever heard of Chapman points, right? So these Chapman points are points on the anterior and posterior aspect of the body. On the right-hand side, the skeleton over here, you can see the, um, the Chapman points um, that are demarcated by uh, the darkening. So you see on the, on the inferior aspect of the ribs, if you go over, this is very small, but it says quadriceps right there. 
So the quadriceps, when someone is ticklish on their ribs, oftentimes, not always, but oftentimes, their quadriceps will also be weak. And the quadriceps and that neurolymphatic point on the ribs is associated with the small intestine. So we're just gonna focus on that for right now because that's a lot of information. So that is all correlated together. Uh, and the neurolymphatic point is basically a backup of lymph in that particular area. And remember, lymph does not have a pump, or the pump for the lymph is actually the muscles, right? The heart, the vascular system has a pump, right? So you'll have the blood pressure can be 120 over 80, whereas the lymphatic system will oftentimes be zero to two millimeters of pressure. So it can easily get backed up. And when it does get backed up, we can correlate it back to an area on the body that will become ticklish or tender, right? So a lot of patients will, will come in to, I'm very ticklish, I'm very sensitive in these areas. Well, that ticklishness after a treatment can actually go away completely. I've seen it hundreds if not thousands of times. Um, so we're utilizing this as a check engine sign. So when I palpate the, someone's ribs and the, the inferior aspect of their ribs, and they tell me that's tender, that's ticklish, that indicates that the small intestine is backed up. And then if you go under the, um, the breast area on the right side of the patient, you'll have the liver. On the left side of the patient, underneath the breast and nipple line, you'll have the, uh, the stomach. You can use the cursor. Okay. Oh, to, you can use the cursor. Oh, perfect. Yeah. So right over here, you'll have the stomach. And then right over here, you'll have the liver liver area. And this is what I was talking about with the small intestine, if you can see the cursor moving back and forth. Um, so just focusing on a, a few of these points, and then this is a very useful point as well on the lateral aspect of the, um, of the, le of the thighs. It's not really a point, it's like a, it's a It's a band. whole band, yeah, yeah. This is not even a, yeah, you're correct. It's actually a band, not a point. Um, and this whole band area, many patients will come in and they'll be rolling their TFLs. And they say, when, you know, when I roll these areas out, I feel so much better. I say, how often do you do it? I have to do it every day. But when I do it, I feel really good. Well, the question is, why, are you, why do you have to do it every single day? And I don't, right? So something is wrong with the, with the individual. And there, the assumption is that it's the muscle being tight, but oftentimes what I find is it's, it's the lymph being backed up in that area for the large intestine. And when you clear out the lymphatics for the large intestine, people feel better. Right? So once you treat the patient, whether that's through manipulation, homeopathy, uh, nutrition, what the patient notices is that they don't have to roll their TFL every morning. Now, if that took five minutes every single morning when they did it, you save them five minutes every single morning and obviously you optimize their health. So neurolymphatic points or Chapman points, so Dr. Chapman, in the, uh, if I'm not, not mistaken, it was 1940s and 50s, he researched these points in a hospital setting. He went around and he would rub these points and find out which organs would be affected and how patients would get better. So these points are very useful. Um, and these are, you can notice that there are many points. So let's say 15 to 20 points or so, you can utilize just right there, right? So you have, let's say 20 check engine lines here. Now you have on the, in, in the middle, on the left, you have the temporal, temporal sphenoidal line between the temporal bone and the sphenoid bone. These are basically trigger points in the temporalis muscle that are associated with different organs, different spinal regions. As you can see here, it says T1, T2, T3, T4, the spinal region, and also it's associated with the muscle. So muscle, organ, spinal region, right? But despite all of that, if you just know that there's tender points over there and you map these areas out, or you just palpate them, and you know, and you have a patient take a remedy, and those points change, they will change immediately. Then you'll, you'll have an indication as to how good the remedy is for that individual. Not only how good, so you'll have an indication whether the remedy is good or not for the individual, A, and B, how good it is. So a, a remedy may decrease the points by 50% of tenderness. It may only decrease two or three of the points out of 10 that have shown up. So that's giving you an indication that it's good but not great, right? When I'm treating and I'm practicing, what I'm looking for is all of these points to be completely gone. Homeopathy is so powerful. It's more powerful than nutritionals. Because I've tested patients with nutrition and I don't get the same response that I do from having patients just smell a homeopathic remedy. And I don't put them on their tongue. Because once you put the remedy on the tongue, it'll clear out all the indicator points and then you have no test pigeons to work with anymore. 
all the check engine lights are cleared out and the patient, you have to wait for them to come back in a few days to see what has shown up again. So the easiest way or the lightest way to test patients is to have them smell it, smell the remedy. I had them smell the remedy. I test, I test these points again. I find out how much of the sensitivity on the ribs, sensitivity on the skull has decreased. And based upon that, I can gauge how good the remedy is for that particular patient, right? Does that all make sense so far? So you find out where where the tenderness or the ticklishness is. Yeah. So that's the point that you test. Like you might find it's only one spot or a couple spots. Yeah. And then you give the remedy and then you test again. Yes, exactly. When the, when the patient first comes in, if it's the first time they're seeing a holistic practitioner, what I find is that every single one of the neurolymphatic points is tender. 95 plus percent of the time. If they've never seen a holistic practitioner before, and I tell them, if they're coming in at 30 years old, I'm like, for, you, for, for me, this is the first time in 30 years that you're seeing a doctor. Because for me, a doctor is what I'm doing, not what they're doing. You can see a doctor at you know, whatever institution, every single year of your life, every six months of your life, but unless they've treated you the way that I'm treating or the way a holistic practitioner is treating, you've never seen a doctor before. So what I find is that all of these points are tender for majority of 90, 95, I would say, percent of patients who come in. The whole skull is tender. So every single point on this, all the 20 points or so on this TS line, so you have 10 on each side, I think it's 10 on each side or so, so let's see, four, yeah, so let's say 20, 30 points. Every single one of these. So now we have how many variables? Let's say 20 some here, 40 some here. You have 60 variables, right? Between the neural lymphatic points and the temporal sphenoidal line. And then we can go into palpatory joint pain. So you go around the joints, you find out do they have any joint issues, any pain anywhere. You can go on the along the meniscal lines, medial meniscus, lateral meniscus. So now you have four more indicator points if they are tender, right? You can go in the cervical, start palpating trigger points, and which I didn't write down here, but trigger points will go away from smelling the proper remedy. So that's, this is why we can give a, a proper remedy, a properly prescribed remedy to a patient and their back pain will go away. Even if I'm finding a rotation in the spine, where normally as a chiropractor, I would manipulate that area. The goal is to put the least amount of effort or least amount of energy or input into the nervous system of a patient and get the biggest response. I don't want to manipulate. I don't even want to touch the patient. If I can put a pellet in their mouth and get a massive response and not have to do that, I'd rather do that. Sometimes, despite the remedy, I still have to manipulate. So, I have, you know, this it's not a, a cure-all, um, but is, it is very useful um, to utilize the system. So you, I'm finding palpatory pain in the ankles, in the feet, maybe between the joints, trigger points in the spine, cervical area. I'm utilizing all of these as variables to assess, to, to assess the change um, pre and post administration olfactory administration of a homeopathic remedy. This can be for homeopathic remedies. You can use this for nutritionals. You can use this for scented oils, colognes. You know, I have uh, at my clinic, uh, I've vetted a number of different types of colognes, and there's a company called Bortnikov. Um, this is a little side tangent. A company called Bortnikov, this Russian uh Master perfumer, his name is Dmitry Bortnikov. He makes all of his perfumes from animal and plant ingredients himself and grinds them, and they're all pure and little to no synthetics put in them. When I have a patient smell that perfume, it can clear out all the neural lymphatic points. So I've vetted, I've ordered samples of 11 of his perfumes just to test them on, on a number of patients to find out how, how good they are. His is one of the best. I have a few other companies, they don't make them as good. And I know some of the owners of these companies, but um, his 11 out of the 11 samples that I ordered, 10 of them would clear the neural lymphatic points by 90% or so. And then one of them was about 60 to 70%. So that one I didn't order for my patients. But that means that if you apply this cologne on or this perfume on, it's made in such a way that when, I'm, when I apply it, not only do I benefit, when I walk across the room, who else benefits? Anyone who smells that remedy or sorry, not that remedy, anyone who smells that perfume will actually benefit from the scent of it, right? Majority of colognes that come from Macy's or, you know, Saks and Fifth, all these, Fifth and Saks, all these other places, they're garbage. They're all chemically made, they're mass produced. You can't put musk, you can't get enough deer to put musk in all those 
perfumes, you know, to get that musk scent. So they're all synthetic and they're deadly. So patients come in and I grab a little bit of the of a cologne that I have that I never use, right, on my desk, just to show them. I'll have them smell it. And then we'll test these neural lymphatic points. And if the neural lymphatic points are cleared up, it will actually make them more sensitive. It will back them up immediately. And then for some reason, I'm not sure exactly why, but the act of swallowing will clear the effect of a remedy or something toxic on the nervous system to bring them back to a level playing field where they were before. So if I have a patient who requires sulfur, they have all the symptoms of sulfur, I did the intake, it all sounds like sulfur, I had them smell sulfur, the 50 different indicator points that I had are all completely gone, right? And then I have them, as long as they're not a sensitive patient, and then I have them swallow, after they swallow, all those neural lymphatic points will come back. That's if they smell it, because smelling is a softer or a lighter way of giving a remedy. If I put that remedy on their tongue, if I make a mistake and I immediately put that remedy on their tongue and it's a good remedy for them, then everything will go away. If they swallow two, three, four times, oftentimes all the neural lymphatic points are all gone. I have nothing else to work with. So moving forward, if I wanted to manipulate an area, if I wanted to try another supplement to see if that would assist it, we have nothing to do. The patient has to leave, come back next week, and then we can reassess. So the application of the remedy on the tongue, I'm finding, is obviously, as, as we've all found and has been historically found, is actually more powerful than the olfactory uh, stimulation. You said they're not sensitive. What if they're sensitive? If they're they sensitive, sensitive I actually have a case of a sensitive uh, patient, and in, in, uh, we're going to go through that. Yeah. And we can also, another variable you can use is eye movements. So saccades, which are the jumps in the eye movements. You can actually follow, you can have a patient follow your fingertip in a, in, in, a, uh, in a circle. And while they're following, you can find the areas where their eyes jump. So if, if a patient has multiple, you know, skips in their eye movement, or it's difficult for them to follow, or they're lagging, or when you stop, they jump over. Those are all variables that you can utilize in order to find out whether the remedy is benefiting or not. And what you'll find is when the patient smells the remedy, I'll have them smell it and I'll say, don't swallow, not even your saliva. Because, right, the swallowing reflex is going to clear that from the nervous system for majority of patients as long as they're not sensitive. So I have them smell the remedy, then I have them follow my eye movements again. Oh, sorry, I'll have them follow my finger again and I'll track their eye movements using my eyes, right? And if the eye movements are more smooth, and convergence is easier when I bring my finger in, then the remedy is better for that patient. Now that, that takes a little bit more skill. The easiest to take home is the temporal spinoidal line and the neural lymphatic points. Those are the easiest. And out of those two, if you just know the neural lymphatic points and learn just five to 10 of those points, it is very, very, very beneficial. It has been in my practice at least. Can you show us the temporal spinoidal line on the cursor? Yeah. So this is, the, this is the temporal spinoidal line right here. Generally, you start right here. The ear should be drawn in right around here. So just above the zygomatic arch. Exactly. You're basically going to ride the zygomatic arch right up to here, up. going up laterally, lateral to the eye, and then posteriorly right up here. And uh, so imagine the ear is drawn right here. So the top of the ear is right here. People start going, and then they go all the way up here on the skull. But really, the ear is drawn right around here, so you're going to be almost going a line back here. And it'll feel, when you palpate, when you get the sense of it properly, it'll feel like little BBs underneath your finger where the points are sensitive. And since we're talking about the small intestine here with the neural lymphatic point, the correlation between the small intestine here is the quadriceps muscle, so that muscle will be weak. And we're not even getting into muscle testing. That's going to be a whole, that would, would have been a whole separate thing. Um, and requires a good amount of skill. Proper muscle testing t requires a good amount of skill because the first thing we learn in muscle testing is how to cheat the test. Because if you think the remedy is going to be right for the patient, you can easily cheat the test unknowingly. So you have to know how to cheat the test so that you don't um, find the wrong remedy just because you think it's going to be the right one. So this is the small intestine right here, and the small intestine point is the second one right here, the second dot. So you can correlate all these together. If you find this area to be sensitive on the ribs, you will generally find this point, all, all other factors being equal, 
which they never are, but you'll generally find that point right there to be tender. And I, I'm gonna have an example. Well, I'll grab someone and pull them up and um, we'll show you guys a case. Here's a case and the remedy is right there. I'm not holding back the remedy <laughs> as we usually do, but the, this is a case of Nat Muir. Uh, this patient had severe psychological traumas um, since childhood uh, and uh, a number of CT scans due to some pains that she's had. And what I find is that when patients have one or more CT scan, they are become sensitive patients. So sensitive that when I take my cell phone and I put it, when I put it on Wi-Fi only, many of those patients, the muscles will start, muscles that were strong before, neurolymphatic reflex points, which were not tender, will become tender. Muscles that were strong before will become weak just by putting on Wi-Fi. And the real sensitive patients, just putting on Bluetooth will do it. Some people, they need a combination between Bluetooth and Wi-Fi to do it. And then the ones who are uh, generally sensitive, and what I feel like is the strongest impulse is the 4G, 5G. Someone's, a lot of people are sensitive to that. I can turn that on, but mostly people who have had CT scans done. Multiple CT scans, it's hard to treat, very hard to treat. And I, I believe Dr. Sain spoke about this in regards to, uh, he said he had a patient, and correct me if I'm wrong, when he was, last time he was here, he had a patient who was, uh, who had some symptoms, but was also in a clinic down in Texas um, where they treat this particular issue. And uh, there were these patients sitting in the, in Texas, sitting in the waiting room together, and they were speaking about their issues, and many of them had more serial CT scan stuff. So I think that CT scans are very detrimental. Another one of my uh, teachers from Spokane, Washington, naturopathic doctor, said that uh, when she does Bolin blood testing, this is where you take a drop of blood, you throw it under a microscope, and you assess it using certain criteria. And you can find out how healthy or unhealthy the individual is based upon that drop of blood. When she does that testing, she treats a patient using hydrotherapy. Over a number of sessions, she notices that the blood gets better and better and better. And the patient will come back after having a the cancer patient or something, will come back after having one CT scan the next day, the blood will look just like it did months ago, in terrible shape. So I'm not sure about MRIs. I haven't really assessed them too too closely um, to know, but CT scans definitely. You had a question, Leah, in the back? Yeah. Um, I guess my question was, in general, is it seems like it's bad to be sensitive, but in terms of like being receptive, like how does that like work? Like what if you're thinking of it in terms of receptivity, like receptivity to a treatment, it seems to be good to be sensitive, like you get acupuncture, some people might respond to it right away, other people might not, or to do muscle testing or um, AK treatment so is is sensitivity necessarily looked at as like i'm sure it's not that binary but um yeah what are your thoughts on sensitivity well maybe we'll let dr some of the seniors in here respond to that and then uh, maybe i'll give my thoughts afterwards okay. uh, yeah but that's a good that's a good question dr shepherd dr pure dr burke we, sensitivities so we don't know if the person is sensitive but it can be so Dr. Shepard is saying, uh, just for those who are online, um, may not have heard that, Dr. Shepard is saying that everyone has a unique um, sensitivity and they can be up to a thousand, you know, if not more uh, full different in, in their sensitivities. So each individual is unique, is that correct? Um, what I'm finding is that as I treat, the sensitivity gets decreases. Um, now you're saying sensitivity to the reaction to a, uh, a treatment such as acupuncture. Well, you have to assume, or homeopathy. or homeopathy, yeah, we have to assume that the remedy was given correctly. And the assumption is that the acupuncture treatment was given by someone who really knows what they're doing and hitting the right spots and not doing a shotgun approach, for, for example. Sure. Right, where, where, you know, it's like, oh, like I went to this acupuncturist and I didn't have a strong response. So there's a lot of variables. So it's like, but in general, I find like, like this patient right here, this Nat Muir, she was very sensitive to multiple medications. She had like a list of medications she was sensitive to. And this is how this, this went. 
She had multiple CT scans, severe psychological trauma. This is just like a, just giving you the gist of it. Very serious when she came in. So I already had, you know, cravings for salt and fish. So the nap near picture showed up, right? I had her lie down. I palpated all these different neurolymphatic points, the TS line, all sensitive, right? I had her smell the remedy, Nat Muir, cleared out everything. So I had a really good feeling, Nat Muir is likely the remedy. Then I had her swallow. And usually, what does that do? It brings everything back, right? Then I repalpated everything, it was still gone. And in between that, his, his, uh, her daughter was sitting in, in the chair and reiterated, my mom is really sensitive. She might be nervous about taking the remedy because she's so sensitive. I was like, okay, I wrote down on the envelope 30C once every, once, uh, every two days, which I almost never give it that. I don't know. That's I, I do this a little bit more frequently, like 30C a day. But I usually don't do that, but that's what I wrote. And then a few minutes later, I palpated again. Still, everything was completely gone. I had her swallow. Everything is gone. And then her daughter was reiterating, this medication, she responded this way, this medication, she responded, okay, then I felt a little bit nervous. So then I said, okay, we'll do a wet dose every, every day. And I just, just a wet dose on the tongue, a little bit, a, a drop or so. And then a little later, before the end of the treatment, I noticed that none of the neural lymphatic points came back at all. It's been like 10 minutes. And she just smelled the remedy once. So then I said, we're we just going to have her smell the remedy once a day. And so she came back in, and majority of her, she was way much happier. Uh, she didn't aggravate, which is wonderful, because normally I would have given that remedy one pill every two days, and she probably would have aggravated, and you know, it would have caused some issues. She didn't aggravate. Her migraines were much better. Her mood was much better. Um, this time she came in by, she felt comfortable coming in by herself, and so um, we saw a pretty big change. And that so. This case uh, exemplifies a sensitive patient, and it, it exemplifies how it can assist you in giving the proper uh, potency of remedy. I didn't have to go up to a 200 and have, to have her smell a 200, which oftentimes I will do. I'm, I find that a lot of patients, if they've never taken homeopathy before, they will respond really well to a 30C. Um, but normally, if she responded well, then if, let's say, 80% of her reflex points were gone, I would jump up to a 200 have her smell that. Does a 200 make everything go away? And what happens is if, if oftentimes that the 200 will, will be like a 50% change or a 40% change, and the 30C will actually have, have a bigger change in the nervous system. Um, so it helps me figure out which remedy to give. And I brought some remedies today um, so we can do some take on a case. Yes, Bob? Getting back to the multiple CT scan experience patients, mm -hmm. So let's say somebody comes in and they have like some kind of a neurologic problem, seizures, and they've got a hundred head CTs. Is there anything you can do to get them to like reset it so you know it can be less sensitive, like a remedy or like or something? Um or anything like that for like or what? No, I'm sure you can you can decrease the sensitivity. I'm I'm sure uh Dr. Sh uh Fjord, Dr. Shepard, yes. Yeah. I mean you could try the remedy X right now. Yeah. I, I learned about that from a patient who had a brain tumor as a ch child. He came in as an adult and had a brain tumor as a child, and what they treated it with radiation treatments. And uh, he had real, he had really bad headaches, and he had was very fatigued. And I tried all different remedies, and nothing was working. Nothing was working. Oh, I thought, well, give him an X-ray. X-ray was like a miracle for him. It helped his energy. Didn't change his headaches. I think the headaches might have been a structural thing, mm. structural with the brain, because nothing seemed to touch that. But his energy, every time he took it, it helped his, his energy. And it's interesting, and totally one of the docs in our office, um, her uh, significant other is a chiropractor, and he does full spine x-rays as part of his you know, treatment strategy. And one time before going in for the x-ray, she took the remedy x-ray. And he went and tried to take the x-ray like the normal way. He could not get it to work. It, it, like, it's like it kept coming up negative. He's like, the, the machine broken or what? And then he went up there and took an X-ray himself, showed it fine. So it, it, that's it wild, remedied that's that very interesting. That 30 or 200 did something that she was not able to be. That's really interesting. That's a, it's a very interesting and phenomenon. And one anecdote, but so. Yeah. Probably the best thing to do would be to give maybe the remedy, the remedy of 
because it's interest. Maybe that gives you best protection. But mm -hmm. barring that, if you just have this history, maybe consider the remedy for an X ray. I know it works for X ray for radiation treatments and certainly to protect against X rays. What potency is used? 3,200. So yeah. giving it boron cells. Boron cells. Yeah. X rays. Yeah. 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 You won't be bad. So homeopathic x-ray and homeopathic radi radium, brome. radium brome. Okay. So and, applying those. Yeah. And it's, it's interesting with these tests, uh, it's not, sometimes it's an x-ray, sometimes it's a contrast. Oftentimes they get iodinated contrast to make the blood vessel show up. Yeah. Uh, with MRI, it's one of the big things I find is I always tell people get it without, uh, without contrast. Because the contrast they get is gadolinium, which is a heavy metal, and people get gadolinium drugs. Although mm -hmm. I had a patient come to me and say, oh, I went in and they wanted to give me gadolinium and I asked whether there any side effects. They said, no. I mean, gadolinium toxicity is a well described <laughs> thing in the radiologic literature, but the tech or whoever probably the perceptions from us, oh, there's no side effects. I mean, it's like they're just kind of lying. That's all. And the thing about sensitivity, I just want to make a comment about that. Yeah, it's a good thing in the sense we, when we see sensitive patients, oftentimes you give them a remedy in the office. And I mean, I don't do this kind of testing, maybe I'll start. Mm -hmm. But you see a response right away. Yeah. I, I think about it in terms of. I mean, you ask them, how do you feel? And they'll say, well, I think it was different. My pain yeah. is different. This is different. There's two types of sensitive patients. There's the positive hypersensitives. They react well with everything. Every remedy you give them, they get a response and it's a problem. And then there's the negative. Like, those are, it's wonderful to treat them. It's you feel great. And then there's the negative hypersensitives. Who every remedy you give them, they aggravate. And the question then, what you're looking for is a remedy where they aggravate, and then you get some improvement. And uh, I've inherited a few of those from Dr. Shepard. Oh, yeah, you, know, you want to buckle your seatbelt and put on your crash helmet when you treat them. <laughs> <laughs> it's no matter what you do with them, it's they're going to aggravate. And the question is, do they get an improvement? And oftentimes you'll see they'll aggravate and you don't get any, but then you have to move on. So those are those are the difficult ones. Those are the ones realize they're out there, and when they come along, you have to be real careful. You want to be real certain of your prescription. The way I think about sensitivity, just in, in general, not even from a medical standpoint, is like being unchanged by the world. Like a baby would be like the most pure or sensitive. Like I associate it with purity almost. So, but maybe I'm, I need to reframe that thinking when I apply it to things like uh, AKA treatments or homeopathy treatments. It could be, yeah, maybe it could be the person is just, you know, just kind of fresh or whatever. Yeah. yeah. But sensitivity can also come, like I'm thinking of the one patient I inherited. I did a hair test on her and she had mercury off the chart. So it can be very toxic. The person can be very toxic. So it's like, it's like a, a bucket. You're trying to fill the bucket, but if the bucket's already full, every drop you put in is going to be over. That's going to be simple. So they react to everything. So it can be a state of, it can be yeah, maybe a pure state, but it can also be the opposite. It can be a very contaminated state yeah. too. I'll just give my little take on sensitivity. I mean, I think like that any of the other takes don't apply, but you can, you know, address the kind of different angles. You know, when you when you repertoireize, essentially, you're looking for the body's sensitivities or the mind's sensitivity. So are you sensitive to anger? Are you sensitive to smells? Are you sensitive to certain foods? Changes in barometer. So if you if your you know sensitivity is not being not categorizing it as a pathology, just as a, a as a human trait for from everything from insensitive to hypersensitive and what the normal mean would be of what you look for. If you have a person that's sensitive to smells and they're they're hypersensitive to smells, they can't go into a, a grocery store with anything without gasping or a clothing store, that that would be considered kind of negative sensitivity, right? Your body isn't functioning so that you exist in the world or if you're sensitive to EMF radiation or um you know, so hypersensitivity, you can use 
you know, they have to put it into perspective. Is that sensitivity affecting that person? You know, it's like a person is intuitive and they're sensitive to, you know, to, to vibrations. They pick up things that somebody else doesn't. That's peculiar to that particular person. So I'm, I'm careful when I use, when I look at how we define a hypersensitive person in a pathological sense, and Andy has had some of those people that, you know, that have lived in Texas in a stainless steel trailer and have to wear organic, non, uh, you know, dyed clothes because everything has impacted their well-being. You know, those people can't function with it. So, but, you know, we've seen people like that, you know, that, you know, that have been maybe poisoned in some way and their biological system can't adapt to the environment. So you, you just have to you know, look at what you're, what you're, you know, you're defining is what, what is somebody who's very sensitive me? You know, is that a pathology very sensitive? Is, is that a, is that a, um, a, a, a special characteristic, you know, where you have clairvoyant dreams and you're sensitive to, you know, you know, you, you know, your things in the future and your, your veil is too thin or whatever that is. And, you know, so, so for each and every person that is different. And, you know, if you're globally hypersensitive, you really have a tough time functioning, I would think. So, um, and then when I think of sensitivity in terms of, and this is just my perspective, of course, and then if you're hypersensitive in terms of reacting to homeopathy, you know, they, you know, some of those people, that's really difficult. Are they reacting to the, are they reacting where, where their, their body is, you know, you don't know if you've even got the right remedy because they're proving it, right? So they're sensitive to the remedies, even to smells and things that. So know. there are different realms of sensitivity, basically, is what you're saying. And then that it could be a good sensitivity and a bad sensitivity. Am I correct in that? Pathology. Agreed. Agreed. Okay. So what we're going to do right now is we're going to move into an actual practical case so that you guys can kind of see at least whoever's here. And then we're going to turn on the video. And uh, this is video, I'm assuming, right here. And so that people online can see. Uh, how do I know that you guys can see? Can you guys see what's going on? I see it on your screen too. Okay, I click that. Yeah, we can we can see you. Okay. okay. Oh yeah, it's on. Could you see the green light? Okay. Can can I? I need to see. Uh, here. I need to be able to see. Is anyone here on a polycrest remedy? Uh, no. We can. We can see better when it's not pointed right at the screen. Is anyone on a polycrest remedy here who is willing to be a uh, what is polycrest? like someone name all them? Sulfur, Thibia, Nugs. Has someone been prescribed that within the last week or month or so? Even if you took one dose? Even if you took one dose? Okay, do you mind if I use you as a, as a you won't dose you if you're worried. Are you a sensitive patient? Well, let me define sensitivity. I'm just kidding. Come up here. Okay, can you guys see me? Can you guys see Bob right here? He sits right here. It became too dark. Okay, it's too dark for us to that light on. Let there be light. So let there be light. And there's light. Okay, can you guys see both of us here? Yes, it is better. Yeah. Okay, good. So I'm gonna have you sign your glasses on for me. Usually I would check the posture, maybe have them walk back and forth. Just put your screen down. Is that better? Okay, thank you. But right now, what we're gonna do is I'm gonna palpate his TS line first, and then we'll go through some of the neural lymphatic points on the abdomen and the front of the body. So I'm going to put some pressure on your skull, okay? So just palpating, we see that it's tender here and here. Do you feel that? Everything should feel like this. Do you feel that? It feels like nothing, right? Just the pressure of my fingertips, no pain, no sensitivity. If I go right here, I can feel that there's swelling here. Yeah, especially more anteriorly on your left. Right there. Yeah. So his adrenals are back up. Adrenal, adrenal, bilateral. You continue going. It's actually all tender. It's yeah. all a little tender. Yeah. 
This is a good case. <laughs> so okay. It's a good case. <laughs> <Bad adaptation. laughs> Can I put your glasses on side? Okay. <laughs> so now I'm going to put some pressure on the ribs. Everyone can see this is the small intestine point we were talking about, right? So he's a little sensitive there. Am I right? Everything should feel like this. You feel that? Generally, not too many trigger points in the bicep muscles. So I use this to show the patients that this is how things should feel. And they're like, really? It feels like you're digging in. They'll say it feels like I'm, and I'll have to tell them, does it feel like I'm pushing harder over here? Yes. This is how it should feel. So now let's go to the left side. The stomach goes right down like this. So you can remember that underneath the left pec muscle is going to between the fifth and sixth intercostal space, just underneath the left pec muscle. You'll find the stomach reflex point. If you drink ice water, you'll have this reflex point show up for 30 seconds to a minute or so. Because the stomach should be around 100 degrees Fahrenheit, so that'll drop the temperature down. It's a sense, ooh, quite a bit tender. Okay. And then on the right side is the liver. So let's just focus on these three. I'm going to go through a few more, but we're just going to try to learn these three. That's sensitive too, huh? A little bit. Not a bit Okay. So we're going to go up here, thyroid and heart. Thyroid and heart, both sides, that a little sensitive? Especially left. Left is more. Okay. And then we're going to find the belly button. We're going to go, where is that at? Right there. Okay. And then just lateral to the belly button on either side is going to be the kidney points. A little tender on the left. Okay. And then if you go up a little bit from those points, you're going to find the adrenal points. All oh, that's a little bit sensitive, right? Yeah. The lungs are right here and here. And your palpation skills have to be really good when you're doing this. You have to practice your palpation because if I go from here to here, I'm changing the amount of pressure that I'm doing. So I can cheat the test very easily and say, smell this. First, I'm going to press here like this, digging into his, you know, tipping my fingertips this way, increasing the amount of pressure per square inch on my fingers and digging in and then say, hey, smell this, smell that. And then I go like this, that changes the whole test. You just cheated the test. Right? So we have to be very conscious of what we're doing and how we're doing it. I've done it so many times that it's almost second nature, but I have to police myself as well. So this is all a little sensitive. Give me three remedies that, um, one of them being the remedy that you're on, and then two other random remedies that are probably dressed. Well, I mean, I only took this one today, this one, but okay. That's fine, yeah. Okay, so, um, uh, carcinosin, uh, sulfur, CQ. Okay. Take the carcinosin out and give me another one. Uh, let's see, uh, we got to take sulfur and CQ. Give me another round of So I can pull one out so we can have a 33% oh, chance of getting it. Uh, sulfur. So we're good. Okay. Okay. I have a 30C, a 200C, and a 1M of the polycrystals right here. So we're going to take those out. So. Making a mess up here. Right. Yes, you can start pulling these out. OK, so you want silica, sulfur? And sepia. We forgot it. I have sulfur. Oh, did I bring silica? I don't think I brought silica. Yeah, let's. I'm gonna use. Uh, that mirror is good. I'm grabbing that mirror right now. You also have calcora. What else is over there? Nux. Uh, I didn't grab the right remedy, son. Sandra has. Yeah, but like a Carcinosin? Yes, yes. Okay, we'll, we'll grab that. Is it 30C? Yes, Okay, we'll utilize that as well. I'll bring that up. Okay, so we're going to do, you just find that in here? Yeah. Good. 
We're going to try not moving sulfur and quartz sulfur. Matthew, uh, sulfur and quartz sulfur. Um, That's not what I was going to go. Well, there was another image that you actually took too. I didn't bring it. Or it was. It's probably uh, CPO. I don't know why I didn't oh, bring it. Uh, I, I just don't have CPO. Do you have CPO? I do. Perfect. I can't grab any of the software. Yeah, I know. <laughs> yes? We're going to try this. It's better for me not to know which remedy. Obviously, in the clinic, I do know which remedy, but this is a demonstration purposes. I prefer not to know, but I do know. So, this is single blind. I mean, I smell this. Don't swallow it, not even your saliva. So, just smelling it. Sometimes they have a stuffy nose and they say, hey, I couldn't smell anything. Well, the remedy doesn't have a smell, have a stuffy nose. As long as you got something in, I generally find a response. Is this any different than before? Uh, less tender. Less tender. Is it gone completely? Not completely, but gone um, better. Okay, don't swallow yet. Is this any different? See, this is all less less tender. Yeah, but it's good. So it's less tender. How much less? Fifty percent decrease. So is that the right remedy? No, because homeopathy is so powerful. When you get the right remedy, everything is completely gone. Swallow it for me. I'll take that with me. And that was a thirty C carcinosin. Now you swallowed, correct? Mm -hmm. Did this come back? Uh, I think so. Did this come back? Yeah. Did this come back? Yeah. Can I just smell this right Don't swallow, not even your saliva. How's this? Better? Is this better than the last one? Uh, I'd say yes. So it's more than 50% better, is that correct? Yes. And so what that says is that nat mirror would be better if we only had two remedies on us. We're on an airplane over going overseas. Nat mirror would have been better than carcinosin for him. Swallow for me. And that's a nat near 30 C particularly. We can try 200. Now we have to make sure the variables come back. That the intensity all comes back. Did that come back? Uh, I'd say yes. Yeah. Did it come back to 100%? Mm, not quite. So there's something happening. Don't swallow. How's that? What percentage did you put on that? Maybe 75%. So that nap near 200 C is doing better than the nap near 30 C. Swallow for me. Will this come back? Uh, yes. How's this? Uh, much better. Is it better than the other ones or about the same? It's about the same. It's about the same. Swallow for me. Smell this one. How's this? Oh, very good. Is this better than the other ones? I'd say yes. Is that gone? Yeah, completely. This is actually sulfur 30C. Oh. So CP is not as good as sulfur mm. for him, according to this assessment. Is that gone? Yes. Is this completely gone? Yes. So now I'm going a little harder. Usually don't do this, but since I'm demonstrating, I want to make sure that I'm being as accurate as possible. How's this? Fine. Any tenderness here? No, no. How about here? No. Swallow for me. Did any of this come back? Yeah. This come back? Uh, no. Yeah. So now let's go to a 200 C of the sulfur and see if that's better than the 30 C, which we just tried. This. How's all this? Yeah. Is this better than the last remedy so far? Um, almost as good. Very good, but not as good. Yeah, not quite. Yeah, not as good because it's 
Yeah, this is a 200C, but there's still some that I can still feel it's like right. more swelling here to clear right. up. So the 30C would have been better than the 200. Let's see if the 1M is better than the than 30C. You swallow it, correct? Did this come back? Um, he's actually swallow again. Get some water now, huh? How is this? Pretty good. It's going to come back. But it's going to come back. How about here? Yeah, it's not too bad. Maybe it's too much. What's the sign? Yeah. How do you smell this one? Don't swallow. How's this? Um, done. Is this the best so far? Mm -hmm. it's the best. It's the best. I say really good. Oh, no, it's... Mm -hmm. it's so Trust the patient, but sometimes you can't trust them completely. I'm not saying you, but you can do muscle testing, and then you just tell them to push back on all these muscles so we can try. You can swallow for me. You can try a supinator. Go right here. Don't let me turn this way. So keep your elbow straight. Don't let me turn your hand. Let's see how this arm is. You're gonna supinate your hand. Get turned this way. Yep. There you go. Turn the other way. There you go. That's just one variable, but you can use multiple different muscles and find out which one corrects all the different muscles as well. Oftentimes you'll find one organ, so you can, it's gonna get a little bit more complicated, but let's just keep it at that. <laughs> so you can just find the muscle, have them smell the remedy. This is a sulfur 30C, smell that for me. And his supinator was actually very weak, it was like, Sometimes you almost feel like the patient's not trying. Hold real tight, don't let me turn. Try again. And now it's a lot easier. You feel that? I will stay hold real tight. Swallow for me. Hold. It's a lot stronger. And now after swallowing, you can't hold it. I will stay hold real tight. Hold real tight. Okay. Now, do you mind if I give you a dose of that remedy? You don't want to take it. Which one? The sulfur there you see. Okay. That one tested the best for you. Okay. okay. Now let's see what happens if we give them an oral dose of the remedy. We didn't check eye movements, so we can check it real quick. Follow right here. Do you feel some strain right around here? I don't know. You can you can look at this all day, right? So when I start pulling in. Right around here, you feel the strain. Mm -hmm. What his eyes are doing when they're moving in, converging, they're going like this. And then right around here, they start going like this. Like one comes in before the other, and then the other tips. And then there's a little bit of strain. What are you doing when you're reading? When you're reading, your eyes go like this. The house is big. So it's converging. So when you read, you ever get sleepy? Okay. Yeah. So he's spending a lot of neural energy just to read books, just to get his eyes to move from one word to another and because of that he's getting sleepy when he reads because his convergence is a little bit off now that was right around here if i'm not mistaken if you feel it correct mm -hmm. okay you can smell that don't swallow follow this in again so it's almost around here that he started so it's about a four to six inch difference in his visual convergence but his actual um, uh, motion, in a, uh, rotatory motion, is actually very good. Were you a reader when you were younger? Yeah. You can tell that from eye movements. If people are jumping all around, they usually don't like reading because they have to reread things over and over again. They're spending a lot of neural energy just moving their eyes, not enough to understand the text. Okay, so the more complex the reading, the, the more difficult it is for them. Okay, so we're going to give you a dose of this. Can you head back to the hangout? 
We can achieve in small hours by itself. Okay, we're going to start right here and we're going to go through and test all the variables again. Hold right here, don't let me turn. And that's very strong, it's very easy for you to hold it. That's right. How's this? No time, Yeah. Is this completely gone? Yeah. And that was a lingering point on the 1M, right? And that's what led us to, to that and a little bit of the stall led us to believe that the 30C was the best for him. All this? Yeah, great. Anything? All left here. Oh. All this. All this. Oh. Is it gone completely? Oh, yeah. And then you can show them again. Everything should feel like this. Does it all feel like that? Mm -hmm. Sometimes you have to remind the patient because they'll be like, oh, well, it feels better than before, so they feel like it's completely gone. But this is probably the right remedy in 30C for him. That's all good. Of sulfur. Well, and maybe the other remedy was right at that particular point in time. And now sulfur is better for him. So I'm not saying that the other remedy wasn't any testing for that remedy at that particular time. Well, okay. Maybe you want to start playing the screen in your eye. Maybe you okay. It's a lot better. Before is right around out here. Get it. So we have to start to see that. What are kind of people who is not good? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Not that good. So you don't really get 50%, mm -hmm. which is good, not great. But with homeopathy, we want it to be 95 to 100%. I generally get 100%. Everything is gone. I can't find anything that's sensitive anymore mm -hmm. with the variables that are utilized when I'm using homeopathy. With some nutritionals, you know, if I get like an 80, 90%, I'm like, okay, this is good enough. But homeopathy, I want it to be 95 plus percent. Completely, everything should be cleared up. Except for some of the eye movements. Sometimes if someone is really jacked up in the skull, then you can't get the eye movements to be like really perfect. But this is this is pretty good. I want I want you to be almost here with convergence before there's any strain. You're still out a little bit, but your reading speed should get better. Yeah. And are there you can go, do you have any questions for me? Yeah, so. What about like a pathology? Now that we know that it's not really true to stuff like that. So, it's just one dose. So, with pathology, there's no way to know from this testing in an outpatient facility how often you give it. One theory that I have is that if it takes six hours for these neural lymphatics to back up again, you may have to dose every six hours. But I need two patients to see in order to do that. <laughs> Right, where I have someone testing maybe every hour, every two hours to see when is when are the reflexes coming back? Can they test themselves? Can they find a spot that's consistently bad? They check and say, Oh, the pain's coming back. Yeah, they can. If you can train them well enough to be able to not tilt their fingers too much and to know have the, all the variables to say when they're when they're pushing on their on their front reflex, so you can do that. It's hard for me to do myself, and I've been doing this for a while, so it's like I think it's that's going to be even harder for patients. Yes. Okay. Um, it's a question that I'm asking because it, it applies to me. Yeah. I had uh, in a car accident, four fractures on this side and two on this side. So my wrist is sick. Mm -hmm. And so how is that? So your ribs are sore. There may be some tension on the nerves from fluid buildup Good. because the ribs are in the wrong position. Mm -hmm. Right? So if you give a remedy, can it decrease? Inflammation in the body can it decrease pressure, can it decrease it rapidly. All those other answer all those questions is yes. Okay. So you can smell the remedy and all that can potentially go well. Oh. well. Maybe, maybe not. But you don't know yet. Yes. Yeah, you can get the BBs up here. You can feel it more more accurately. But in the lymphatic points, sometimes it's a little bit difficult. If they've been backed up for a very long time, you'll feel little nodules in the lymphatic, and you'll feel them lighten up a little bit. But I don't worry too much about that because that takes more time. You have to sit there and go over a few times. And um, one of the biggest uh, factors in clinical practice is you want the time to be as short as possible so you can treat the most number of patients. And then it also makes it more economical for the patient. So how can we, the goal is how can we increase our reach? And we're going to talk a little bit about the pros and cons next. Thank you so much, yeah.
Yes. Is that something that can get better exercise? Yes. Yeah. 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 People read well because uh, their alignment, their skull alignment is good. So there's a genetic predisposition for aptitude and IQ. That's one factor. But also you, you have to, in order to get to your genetic potential, your skull has to be balanced, right? Homeopathy can do some of that. Sometimes you need cranial work, you need trigger point work. Once you balance that out, I've seen uh, one patient, her IQ went up 11 points after a treatment of cranial work, um, which is more than I think standard deviation or so. Um, so yeah, you can change it pretty dramatically. She had a few head traumas, and that's why when I did the cranial work, her IQ changed quite a bit. And I don't do the IQ testing; it was a third party who did it. Um, but just by reading every day, for 30 minutes, you would notice the time you think better. Can you train the eyes by reading every day for 30 minutes? Yeah, you can. Just like with sports, the patients will come in and be like, "How's your hand-eye coordination?" I play sports for for a while, you know, so it's it's pretty good, and I, you know, I'm I'm better than most. But they played for 10, 15, 20 years a certain sport. Whenever I'm tracking their eye movements, they're really not that good. So they had to train themselves to get to a certain level, right? And they had to work harder than their colleagues, or work harder than they would have had to if their skulls were balanced. Yeah, because I remember one time we did a piece of Yeah. Being a boxer is bound to be the high. So they were bound to have any structural problems show up all over the left. But they still have to do it too. Yeah, so being a boxer, yeah, you are bound to be hit in the head. But the amount of damage that's done by getting hit in the head is going to differ based upon the, the jaw and the placement of the jaw and the lining up, up of the teeth. So you can decrease concussions, I think, goes by, by about 80% if the cusps line up really well. So there, you see some people, they're getting knocked in the head and they're like concussed, they're out and their whole life changes. Another person gets the same amount of pressure, their head is the same size, but the cusps are lining up really well. And then the chance of concussion is going to be dropped drop dramatically. They can go through eight to 10 you know, times more uh, trauma, you know, cranial trauma, and not have the same it's response. Are you yeah. with, with the or, or? No, just the teeth being in line. Um, yeah, so sometimes the cervicals are off. And when you lean the head forward and backward, the, the, the mandible will slide. So for example, Dr. Bovin, my, my teacher actually, it's an interesting story how he came up with a technique. Uh, we'll, we'll go over that real quick. But basically he was sitting in a room of dentists who was training them. He's a chiropractor himself. He's training these, his father was a dentist. So he's training these dentists about how to correct certain, you know, TMJ uh, issues. And uh, one of the patients came, one of the uh, dentists came up and he said, move your head back and forth. He said, yeah, my, my jaw is sliding when I move my head back and forth. And then another uh, dentist in the room said, that's called a natural glide or natural slide, something like that. And it's supposed to do that. Dr. Bovin stood there and he said, well, he thought in his head, if I was walking in the woods and I was eating an apple and I leaned my head back to look at a squirrel up in a tree, my cusp would line up and I could break a cusp. So it doesn't make logical sense that, the, that God would have created the body in that way. So then he went through and he figured out why that individual had, he basically the cervical was rotated in a particular direction that causes that issue of the jaws kind of sliding back and forth. And you can take a board and put it right here, take a pencil, put it right here. So you guys can see me in the, uh, in the video. And what you can do is you'll see when you slide that your, your, uh, the pencil back and forth that the pencil will be tipped on one side. And that means that one eye is, is you know, basically off from the other when you separate it using uh, you know, a board or a piece of paper, you separate it, you'll see that there's, yeah, you need to have a little bit more distance than what you guys are doing right now. You can't do it this way. You need to have like maybe 12, like six to 12 inches. And once you do that, you'll see that tipping um, from one side. It's almost like the pencil is broken here. And when I dip down here, it's straight, then it's broken again. So that means that eyes are gambled, right? Um, and then that will lead to, uh, yeah, that can, that can cause, that could uh, be, that could lead you to going to the cervicals to correct that area. And then, and then that will level it out. It'll change your reading speed, peripheral vision will change, a lot of these factors. Kind of like, it's interesting how Dr. Sane would, would do, his father would do these three hour exams, right? In the facility he was at, and he would check peripheral vision. When he was here, he did that bi, bilateral nasal specific technique. Um, so a lot of these things can change, I think, with homeopathy and then cranial work, obviously, as well. I've done swallowing. 
why does swallowing undo the uh, the neurological impact of smelling a remedy or tasting a remedy? Um, we're not sure, but it's just a phenomenon that we've noticed. It's a very, when you look at the neurology of swallowing, it's very complicated. This is going from here all the way down and there's a number of signals that have to be right in line. So um, for some reason that has the impact so much so that if you put a supplement vitamin C on the tongue and then you have them swallow, and sometimes there's still vitamin C on the tongue. So the oral thalamic reflex is still there. The signaling going to the brain from the mouth is still there, but it'll, but the reflex will be gone meaning that the tenderness will come back as if it's not on the tongue anymore. So why it happens, I'm not exactly sure. Yeah. Doesn't it reset cranial nerve 9 and 10? Does it reset cranial nerve 9 and 10? Uh, I'm not smart enough to know that. We have any functional neurologists? Yeah. So maybe that's that's part of it. And then at a yeah. deep level, the brain brain brains down wherever those nerves are in the nuclei are resetting that part of the brain. There you go. Yeah, and that's that's a possible theory. When you get nervous, you swallow. When you get nervous, you swallow. Yeah, yeah. So I wonder if that's clearing some type of neuro neurological reflex in your body. It's interesting. So let's talk a little bit about the pros and cons of what I just spoke about. Because there are pros to it, but there are also, you know, some uh, issues with with uh, applied kinesiology and testing that can come up, um, and we don't want to skim over those. Some of the some of the pros: decreased treatment time, more patients treated. Right. The goal is to uh, the, the goal is to get as many people healthy as possible. And we're we are a handful of individuals in this room, and there's too many sick people out there. So we can decrease the amount of time that we spend with the, the, the uh, treatment and increase the number of patients or our reach that we have in the community in which we're in. Uh, it can decrease the cost because if, if, if I have to take three hours for an intake versus one hour for an intake, we can decrease the cost to the patient, right? Um, which may increase the number of individuals who have you know, the wherewithal to actually afford our care because it's not covered by insurance. So these are things that we have to keep in mind. Um, and then you can also get a more accurate prescription more rapidly. Um, so the accuracy of the prescription, assuming that when you did this exam, you did it the right way and you didn't cheat it, you, you learned it properly. So there are a lot of assumptions being made here. Um, some of the cons, it may decrease your desire to study the repertory. And I spoke to Dr. Shepard about this, and this is, you know, you may become lazy. And that the goal of this is not to become lazy, because what if you're treating someone to be a telemedicine? And for the last 15 years, you've been using a case, you're not studying this stuff. And someone, a family member is sick or someone, you know, you know is, is very sick. Now your skill set has dropped dramatically. You don't have access to the patient. They're telling you these symptoms. You don't recall what symptom is aligning with what, with what remedy. So it puts you in a bind. Um, so we want people to continue to study the repertory and know it quite well so that even if they don't have access, you know, to their hands or, to, you know, to the patient, that they can still utilize homeopathy at a high level. You may not have enough uh, variables, and uh, we went over like maybe 50, 60 variables right now, but you may not have enough. They may only be, the patient may only come up with sensitivity in two, three areas. And there, you may find that multiple remedies are clearing that same area. So what do you have to go to? You have to go to the repertory, which symptoms line up best, and then give that remedy. So uh, that's another issue if you don't have enough variables. I don't, I don't find that to be an issue too often, but sometimes I do find a lot of variables, but like two remedies are very close, very, very close. And then I'll open up my textbooks and I'll see, okay, which one lines up better. So you're going to amalgamate these two models of question and answer, you know, and uh, the physical exam. Like I said earlier, the patient has to be with the practitioner. You can't do this via telemedicine or anything like that. And then, you know, this is utilizing classical AK, not the offshoots of AK where you can use one muscle test and use intention and those types of things. Is there some benefit to that? Potentially, I've tested a few, uh, call, I've uh, done some single blinded tests with a few colleagues and I didn't find that other offshoots of classical AK being as effective as the applied kinesiology that I was utilizing right now. Can you come down, because like in, in, in Bob's case, you how do I come up with the few remedies that I came down with? Uh, so what I do is I do a normal intake. I ask all the questions, what makes it better, what makes it worse, what brings you in today? I do all that at the beginning and then I put it into my uh, program. I have MacRep. Um, I put it into the program or Synergy. I put it into the program and then 
I look at the top few remedies, and then I may quickly open my book and ask a few confirmatory questions, and then I narrow it down to three to five remedies. So I think it's I think it's relatively, from my limited uh, experience, it's relatively easy to find three to five remedies that to narrow it down. But to go from five remedies to one remedy may take an hour to two hours. And correct me if I'm wrong. So that, that's where it becomes very difficult because you're going to send the patient home generally with one remedy. You may say, hey, take this remedy. If this doesn't work, take the next remedy. And in an acute case, you want them to get better very rapidly. But oftentimes, you'll narrow it down to one remedy. So to get down to that one remedy is very difficult. To get down to three to five remedies is very easy or relatively easy, and it takes a lot less time. Good. Future research considerations, uh, when do we redose a remedy, the postology that uh, Bob already brought up? Um, is there a more objective way to, you know, of following the symptoms than having the patient let you know, hey, it got better until this time, and then I need another remedy? I think we need an inpatient, an inpatient facility. It's actually supposed to be inpatient facility uh, needed for research. Um, what other variables can be used? We look, use eye movements and uh, palpatory tenderness and neurolymphatic points. Um, trigger points you can utilize. Uh, are there any other variables? There's a machine called the right eye. Has anyone ever heard of that, the right eye? It, it scans your eye movements at probably like 100 um, frames per second, and it will tell you, it'll, uh, as, you're reading a, um, as you're reading a passage and uh, as you're tracking, you know, uh, uh, tracking a dot or something, and it, it'll, it'll uh, gauge your nervous system's ability based upon your eye movements. And we can give a remedy before and after, and we can check, and that's very objective. There, that's used in, you know, in the NFL and different sports teams. The government uses it. The Air Force is using it for their flight pilots. So it's a $20,000 device, so anyone who has a lot of money is willing to put into that. We can do a lot of research to that, and we can prove that homeopathy, just by, by taking a dose of a remedy pre and post, it's not the air in the room. It's not the light coming in through the windows. It's the remedy that you just took affected the eye movements that greatly. So patients coming in with a concussion, their score out of 100 can be like 20 or 30. And when you look at the scan of the eye movements, it's terrible. It looks like the person can't track anything. And these people, they can't drive. It's hard for them to drive. It's hard for them to, you know, you know, move around a room, right, let alone read. They, reading is extremely difficult for these individuals. You give them a remedy, and you can see the change. You do cranial work, you can see the change. Yes? I was talking about how you were actually how the remedy that people have felt here come you mm -hmm. can see a dramatic change in the fact that you took the remedy. That's amazing. Probably less yeah, probably less expensive. Probably yeah. Not that much, yeah. <laughs> so EEG. Right eye. Right eye, right eye machine. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. One word, right eye. Yep. Those are $7,000, I think last time I checked, $7,000, and then you pay $2,000 annually, $1,500 to $2,000 annually, or you can get it, you can buy it right out for like $19,000. I don't like leasing these things, so I pushed them for an offer, and they said around $19,000, $20,000 to buy it off. Um, so yeah, we talk about the right eye. Endocardiograph can be utilized. Um, objective. These are more objective variables. It's more for research purposes. Endocardiograph is something that Dr. Royal Lee, the founder of Standard Process, uh, created. And uh, I believe he created it, but he definitely utilized it. And you can take a supplement. He found if you put supplements on the tongue, you can see changes in the endocardiograph, which is measuring the... Um, it's like an EKG, but it's not an EKG. It's like measuring the uh, impulses. Uh, I don't exactly remember, but it's like, it's like an EKG, but it's not. Yeah, and then you can check which organs are down based upon the based upon the action of the heart. Like, oh, the gallbladder is backed up, or your liver is backed up, and then you can confirm that using palpatory findings. You can confirm that using objective findings, you know, through physical exam and things like that. So there are other objective variables as future research considerations. Does anyone have any questions before we end this off? Yes, Doctor. Please repeat. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, there's a neural lymphatic points and acupuncture. They don't. The neural lymphatic points and the acupuncture points do not intersect. I do believe that there are different sy systems. The, um, yeah. yeah I don't think it was Any other questions? We had one um, online. Yeah, can you please repeat the heart test, the last one that you, you uh, mentioned? 
It's called an endocardiograph. They don't have any of those machines out. If you find one, it's going to be a chiropractor who's had one from a long time, an older, an older machine. They haven't been making them for a number of years, but they're around three thousand dollars, three to five thousand dollars. If you find one, let me know. I'm looking for one too. I just, I just quickly googled right eye, and actually they are, uh, they are the test is reimbursed by the insurance, and they also have a CPT code for it. Just that was interesting. Yeah. Oh, interesting. Yeah, that's good to know. Oh, it's a heart sound recorder. Yeah, the heart sound recorder is something they made that's like the endocardiograph, but people who have tried the HSR heart sound recorder and the endocardiograph have found that they, they do not match up well. So the endocardiograph is recording sound? Yeah. Okay, so it's not recording electrical impulses. No, no, yeah, so it's sound, and which will give you like kind of like the velocity and pressure that's released by the heart. Any other questions? Do you want to put down your um, assistant condition to the patient? Sure. Um, where would I put that? Where did you put that? Box? Yeah, you can. Uh, I'll put it here yeah, in, the, it in. in the box. No, I'm a physical practice. I don't do any telemedicine. Oh. If I have a website, yeah, you can Google me. Yeah, I'm gonna invite it for. Oh, yeah, you can do invite for holistic. dot com. Go to that website. Um, yeah, that has all the information on there. Oh, thank you so much for the time. Sorry for running. We all ran over one after the other from the weekend. Just one more thing, Doctor. Uh, uh, how how is this different? So you said we use variables. How are those variables different than the biofeedback? Or are they intersecting at some point with biofeedback? Or is biofeedback, could biofeedback be also used as one of the variables? Yeah, biofeedback can be used as a variable, and that would be more, a more objective variable. You just need to have access to something, to the biofeedback machine, so you need to purchase that. Um, I think it's best to be able to uh, train yourself in my personal opinion train yourself first and foundationally to be able to do everything without any devices and then move up but yeah biofeedback phenomenal device but then you're going to be tied down to a particular location whenever you're treating um and then you're going to be reliant upon that to a degree uh, okay yeah okay thank you should i shut this off uh, yeah, okay I think, uh, Amishi, were there any other, uh, Susan, are you still there? I am still here. Uh, I think we were able to get the questions uh, using the chat. Um, Do we have any questions for Susan? Susan? We're going to leave those to the end? Or for yes. Roger, for that matter. Yes, yeah, so I think one was uh, still unanswered. Uh, that question is from Joletta. And it is, uh, does the pH of the water uh, one drinks make a difference or have they not tested for that? Um, I, I know that I know that in the uh, finer parts of doing a glyphosate analysis, if we've got, if 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 for example the urine is too alkaline, um, there's there's problems with it. And I know that it is more active in biological systems in in different pHs, but sometimes that that looks at the the you have to consider all the other variables within the system. Um, as well, I think it's more important to just get water and and it, the the cleanest water that that you can get, and I think that's more important than fussing around with you know is it this pH or that pH. I have a, a question for you, Susan. This is Tim, mm -hmm. um, or it's just sort of a comment. Um, I think in clinical practice we find. Um, and having done chelation for heavy metals and stuff like that, it seems like everyone is like um, magnesium, maybe calcium deficient, magnesium deficient, zinc deficient. Mm -hmm. I wonder how much of that is due to uh, glyphosate. A lot of it. In my clinic. You in said the first patent was for a descaler. So it's basically, yeah. it basically chelates all these positive ions in our body, yeah. which are all the cofactors for enzymes. Yep. So, so where, you know, where I, well, yeah, where I didn't go, um, you know, was was then we start looking at what happens with the relationship, you know, like with 
cobalamin metabolism and that sort of stuff. So we're seeing a whole lot of problems in, in pigs particularly. I think we see it in people and other species, but we're really seeing it in pigs um, be, because of the influence of, of the, the glyphosate on the molecular structure, the, 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 the yeah, the molecular structure of, of, of those things. The other thing that I didn't even, I, I should have put a screenshot up of it, but you know, we've got hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of enzyme systems that we know are affected by, by uh, glyphosate. And so sometimes when I have a, when I have a thing where I'm thinking, geez, I wonder if that has anything to do with it. Cause you know, you get on these tangents and, and like the whole world's a hammer, right? And, 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 and away we go, or the whole world's a, a nail, I mean. And, and so sometimes, you know, it's just like, calm down, just think about this logically. And, and you can go back and you can look at those enzyme systems and they go, oh, yeah, you know, the likelihood is that it is related to this physiologic process, for example, because of the influence that it has on, on this particular suite of enzymes. What is the impact of glyphosate on the, you mentioned cobalamin. What's the impact on cobalamin? Be, because of the collation um, be, be, and its relationship with copper? Cobalamin has a copper as part of it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. And also the other, the other impact too in, in a broader thing is when we look about where do our B vitamins come from or most of our B vitamins come from, you know, it's, it's from fermentation and, and metabolism in, within the intestine, right? And if all of our intestinal bacteria are skewed, uh, they're not going to be able to do their job. Thank you. I just want to say that was an absolutely fascinating presentation that we just that we just had. It, it was absolutely lovely and, and answered some really specific questions that I had about some some things. And I I'm really glad I'm really glad that 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 you did that. Thank you. All right. And if there's no further questions, we will adjourn our meeting. And let's see the next meeting. So it's going to reserve for the, um, the summer. Next meeting is going to be September 16th, Saturday. And um, we're going to have at least two lectures, but for sure I know Ashley B. Adam is going to be one of them. So that should, stay tuned for that. You should all come back for that. It should be very good. And otherwise, we'll just say thank you to our two excellent speakers today and have a great summer. Thanks, guys. Thank you, Bob. Have a okay. nice summer. And thank you, guys. All right, I'm gonna turn off the webinar. So who's joining us for lunch to talk more homeopathy?